Welcome and thank you all for standing by. All participants will be on a listen-only mode for the duration of today's conference. I would also like to inform parties that the call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And I'll now turn the meeting over to Ms. Claudette Powell. Thank you, ma'am. You may begin. Thank you. This is Dr. Clydette Powell. I'm the designated federal officer for the National Clinical Care Commission, and I would like to welcome our National Clinical Care Commission and our members of the public. This is the second meeting of the National Clinical Care Commission, um, our first meeting being in October 31st at the NIH campus, an in-person meeting, and we were delighted to welcome the public there. Um, today's meeting was originally planned for January 16th, but had to be rescheduled because of the partial government shutdown. So we're pleased with the flexibility of our presenters and the public who have joined us today on February the 20th. Um, this, as you know, is a webinar, a virtual meeting. Um, the public will be in listening mode only. Let's go ahead and get started with a roll call. I'll begin with our federal agencies and um, with your uh, agency and name. So, Howard Tracer from the Agency of Quality. Hi, I'm here. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry, we, we couldn't hear. Is that AHRQ? Yes, that's correct. AHRQ. Um, Ann Albright from the Centers for Disease Control. Yes, hi, everybody. I'm here. Thank you. Barry Marks from CMS. I'm here. Aaron Lapata from Health, uh, Human Resource, Health Resources and Services Administration. Hi, this is Aaron. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill Chong from the FDA. Hi, I'm here. Don Shell from Department of Defense. Here. Ann Bullock in Health Service. Good afternoon, I'm here. Barbara Linder, National Institutes of Health. Yes, I'm here, thank you. David Wong, the Office of Minority Health. Here. Naomi Fukagawa from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I'm here. An alternate uh, for Dr. Paul Conlon is uh, Len Pogash from the Veterans Administration. I'm here. Great, thank you. Have I missed anyone? All right, and then the remainder of our roll call are our non-federal uh, members. We'll begin with the chair, uh, Bill Herman. I'm here. Jasmine Gonzalvo. Hello, I'm here. Dr. John Boltry. I'm here. Dean Schillinger. I'm here. Terry Bowen. Hi, I'm here. Shannon Idzik. I'm here. Bill Cook. I'm here. Ellen Leak. Yes, I'm here. David Strogat. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Um, Carol Greenlee, are you present? Uh, Meredith Hawkins and Ayatunda Dokun are not able to be here. And then we, I would also like to welcome our guest presenters from the Bureau of Prisons, uh, Susan Alou. Hello. Great. And Christine Lee from FDA. Hello. And Tracy Branch from HRSA. I am here. Excellent. Is there anyone that I have overlooked? Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining. And again, thank you to the public who have joined us. We appreciate your interest. And um, although this is a listen-only session, there are still opportunities to provide uh, input through our um, inbox and uh, website. All right, just a few brief comments about this meeting. Uh, we have a full agenda. This will be presentations by eight agencies, which are, are done by 10 presenters. Each agency presentation will last up to 20 minutes. Uh, there may be a few minutes for a point of clarification, 
Um, but we will then move on to the next agency presentation. We will have four presentations until a break at 2.50, at which time we have a 10-minute break. And then we uh, take on the second half of the program with four other agency presentations until about 4.40. From 4.40 until 5, we will have some commission discussion and closing remarks. Um, so I would like to go ahead and keep us on time. And we will start with the first presentation from the Bureau of Prisons. This is Dr. Suth Alou from the U.S. Public Health Service, who is the Deputy Chief Pharmacist at Fort Worth. Um, Dr. Alou will be talking about diabetes management in the Bureau of Prisons, opportunities and challenges. Dr. Alou. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, fortunately for me, years of elementary school presentations being uh, early in the alphabet have hopefully prepared me for going first, so we'll see how we do here. I'm so glad to be able to uh, share with all of you the activities that we have in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Next slide, please. So I am not an interesting enough person personally to have any conflicts of interest or financial relationships, and the opinions expressed are my own. Next slide. I want to share with you a moment um, the mission of the Bureau of Prisons to help you understand you know, the lens from which um, to view some of these activities. So our mission is to protect society by confining offenders in controlled environments that are safe, humane, cost efficient, and secure, that also, very importantly, provide work and other self-improvement opportunities to assist offenders in becoming law-abiding citizens. Next slide, please. So within the Bureau of Prisons mission, our mission in the Health Services Division is to deliver medically necessary health care effectively and in accordance with proven standards of care. So again, that's important. You can see that we are evidence-based without compromising public safety concerns, again, inherent to the overall mission. Next slide, please. So these are numbers, again, that were probably pulled towards the ends of December um, to let you know a little bit about the burden of disease um, in my agency. So we have about 12,000 inmates with diabetes, and I ran the numbers again this morning, and that does seem to be, um, again, pretty accurate. Um, of those, I have 6,500 inmates with diabetes who are greater than 50 years old and roughly 3,800 who are prescribed insulin therapy. Next slide, please. Getting back to, uh, you know, uh, again, some of the mission, um, the core principles. So as noted early in the Health Services Division program statement, two of our core principles are human value and public safety. This is important because all incarcerated persons have value as human beings and deserve medically necessary health care. Health care for incarcerated persons must be delivered within the constraints of correctional concerns and responsibilities inherent, again, to our overall mission. I love my job. You will find many people like me within my agency who are passionate about this idea that correctional health is public health. 95% of incarcerated persons will return to the community at some point. So the safe confinement of these people and their rehabilitation for successful reentry into the community benefits each and every one of us. I find this very personally uh, fulfilling as I align my mission in health services with the overall mission of the Bureau of Prisons. And I sincerely believe that the work we do in health services contributes to that successful reentry. Next slide, please. So we have a unique mission. We have unique opportunities uh, with access to care with our national menu that includes a heart healthy menu. Um, I wanted to speak to this because I believe in the last meeting there was quite a bit of discussion about um, concerns with food insecurity. So whereas food insecurity is a significant concern in many populations, it's not so in our population. So we'll discuss a little bit later in the presentation some exceptional situations that we have to be prepared for that relate um, to food intake, but in terms of food insecurity, that barrier is, is not as significant for us. Um, with access to care, a recent study in JAMA Interna Internal Medicine found that one in four patients experience cost-related insulin underuse, but medication is provided for our patient population, reducing this common barrier. Also, uh, we all understand that um, when we're managing a disease state like diabetes, this is our patient's whole life is affected, and so that includes our activity. Um, and we do have uh, our recreation services, and we have a wide variety of programming available. Our pa patient population is encouraged to take advantage of this programming, which includes music, arts, and athletics. Next slide, please. 
So with our unique challenges, means we maybe have to make a few little adjustments uh, to make sure that we're providing appropriate management. So I'm going to discuss a couple of programs here, the Inmate Glucose Meter Program, our clinical guidance on the management of diabetes, uh, collaborative practice agreements for clinical pharmacists, and data informatics. Next slide, please. So the first uh, program here is for glucose meters. So in about December of 2009, uh, there was a program uh, started that would permit insulin-dependent inmates to carry glucose meters for self-monitoring. So this provided our patients with an additional tool for them to have with them to appropriately manage their blood sugar, potentially reducing the frequency and severity of hypoglycemic episodes. Now, implementation of this program requires the consent of each institution's warden and universal adoption um, was not immediate and it's not, um, there, there hasn't been a universal adoption. Now, this is a webinar and I can't see everyone's webcam, so I'm not quite sure how you're reacting to that, but if there are those of you who, for whom this seems overly cautious, please keep in mind that the Bureau of Prisons witnesses ingenuity beyond the bounds of imagination, and one should never presume that any given object will be used solely for its intended purpose. Now, as far as the uh, results of this intervention, uh, there was an article in 2015 in the Journal of Correctional Health that looked at the effect of blood glucose self-monitoring um, among inmates with diabetes, but uh, they did not find a clinically significant difference in A1C, and it did not appear to address questions of hypoglycemia. Next slide, please. Our clinical guidance. All right, so we have evidence-based guidance focused on unique correctional aspects. Whenever possible, our providers are referred to the appropriate expert bodies providing clinical guidance. Um, but we do have a few additional correctional concerns. For example, needle and syringe accountability and the timing of insulin with food intake. All insulin administration is directly observed therapy. Each insulin syringe must be passed back to the staff member dispensing it. And with the exception of insulin pumps in perhaps an emergent situation, all insulin therapy takes place during designated times called insulin lines. So this is a situation in which um, you know, the patient's housing unit will be called uh, for the meal and they will first uh, go to health services to uh, wait in line to receive their uh, directly observed insulin therapy. And then they will proceed from there uh, to go to receive their meal. Next slide, please. So as you can imagine, there is some waiting involved um, in these situations, and so there are some slight modifications for our correctional setting. We will more often than not use regular insulin instead of a rapid-acting insulin uh, because we want our injection schedule to be as forgiving as possible in the event that something happens. There may be a time when uh, a patient approaches the insulin line, receives their injection, and then may need to wait uh, for a, a special movement in order to, to um, go to the, to the main line, to uh, where they receive their mail. Um, therapeutic modifications might be necessary based on the availability of insulin lines at their institution. So depending on um, how many insulin lines are available. Is there a bedtime insulin line at a particular institution or not? May, need, may require some guidance as to um, how would we address that. And then also educating the patients about uh, carbohydrate intake and insulin dose management. Um, making sure that uh, our patients understand uh, the importance of consistency in their carbohydrate intake uh, that goes along with that insulin. We don't want our patients to go to insulin line and then not go to uh, receive their meal. Next slide, please. Collaborative practice agreements for clinical pharmacists. Uh, so Dr. Bullock had mentioned at the last meeting that Indian Health Service utilizes clinical pharmacists in ways beyond what many health systems do, and we absolutely agree that it behooves us to utilize our clinical pharmacists to their full potential. If you have a force of highly trained, skilled, motivated, <clears throat> not to mention humble, pharmacists, then let's use them. So uh, in 2014, the BOP Pharmacy Residential Training uh, took place in August um, and certified about 85 pharmacists through a specially designed program. Um, and at that time, the number of pharmacy CPAs increased from, um, for diabetes management, increased from one to 21 by September of the following year. Um, Pharmacy-based services continue to expand as we leverage our existing assets to meet greater needs. Uh, another step that was taken with the CPAs was that um, in 2017, uh, we created for our electronic medical record uh, a standardized template. 
and it's quite comprehensive, including cardiovascular risk reduction items and screening for preventive health interventions. Um, and this ensures that uh, of the many, many pharmacists throughout the, the BOP who have collaborative practice agreements, that um, we are all completing the same tasks and providing the same uh, standard of care. Next slide, please. Well, this might be a, a small slide, but this is one of my favorites uh, with our, our um, informatics. So we're collating data from the electronic health records, our Bureau's electronic medical record and other electronic sources. Um, and these are a wonderful new tool. I believe Ann Albright uh, discussed at the last meeting the strategy of using electronic health records. Um, we have these dashboards that are able to uh, extract some data right now from our health record. And these have made my life so much easier. This is a wonderful way to very quickly be able to um, look through some of um, what's going on in at your institution um, with your specific patients um, as far as their um, lab results and um, various demographics. Um, so we're looking to, this is actually expanding um, we're looking to have increased capabilities from what uh, the system can uh, extract from our uh, electronic health record, hopefully by the end of this year. Um, but we're, we're very excited to be working smarter and not harder with the use of uh, the data informatics. Next slide, please. And those were some of the things I was hoping to share with you about uh, the activities of the Bureau of Prisons with relation to diabetes management. Thank you, Dr. Alou. We appreciate uh, getting a window into the kind of work that the Bureau of Prisons is doing. We have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, I can open it up to the Commission. Uh, this is Bill Claudette, Herman. Thank you. A... This is, sorry, go ahead. Um, I'll wait. How many, how many people uh, are in the, or how many inmates are in the Bureau of Prisons, and uh, roughly? And when you said uh, insulin dependent, diabetes for the meters, was that insulin-treated patients or patients with type 1 diabetes specifically? Wonderful clarification, clarification questions. Yes, uh, let me clarify. So there are about 151,000 uh, persons in BOP custody right now. Um, there, with regard to the insulin, um, I believe that the standard is that so long as the patient is on insulin therapy, whether or not they have additional um, non-insulin therapies, then they may uh, be dispensed a meter, yes. Okay. I want to follow up on that question. I, um, I would like, uh, so you haven't broken down the population on your, your slide um, around insulin dependent, those with type 2 that are on insulin versus type 1. Um, but are you saying that on the insulin line that that is just a bolus of insulin to cover meals? Uh, what about correction uh, boluses? Uh, so that's one question. And the second question I have is with your uh, electronic health records, is there, have you reached the point when you can tell whether patients um, that have self-care uh, meters are doing better uh, than though in those institutions where um, they have uh, no um, access to meters uh, in, in terms of their own uh, personal uh, space? Yes, ma'am. Those are excellent questions. So at the insulin lines, the patient would receive um, any insulin which they're prescribed, basal insulin, bolus insulin for the meal, and yes, also correctional insulin um, is uh, also received at that time. Uh, we are not yet capable of separating out uh, the results that we have from those who are carrying glucose meters to those who are not. Um, but again, towards the end of this year, we're anticipating some additional capabilities with our dashboards um, in which um, we may be able to, to work on that. Uh, Insofar as we, we can perhaps see differences um, from institution to institution, but we wouldn't be able to separate out uh, the patients at a given institution who aren't carrying a glucose meter. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Can the question identify themselves, please? Uh, yes, um, that was Ellen Leake. Thank you, Ellen. We just need that for the record. 
Other questions? Hi, this is Sherry Bolin. I just had a question about, um, could you speak a little bit to what weight loss programming is offered? I know you mentioned recreation and, and sort of heart healthy meals, but are there DPP-like programs that are offered, or diabetes prevention programs that are offered to um, inmates, and, and how does that work across the system? That's a really great question. Uh, so there are many individual efforts. Um, you know, I think, again, Dr. Bullock spoke to the diversity that is found in the Indian Health Service, and we also have quite a bit of diversity on the Bureau of Prisons. So uh, you will see that these programs are probably um, different or tailored uh, from institution to institution. Some of them are uh, taught by perhaps a diabetes educator um, who's trained as a nurse or perhaps the dietitian. Um, I know here at the Federal Medical Center in Fort Worth, our dietitian runs a program um, for those uh, for, for obesity prevention. Um, so you'll find a lot of individual um, efforts as well as, again, uh, with the heart healthy menu. Um, that's, again, one of our, our strategies. But for, for programming, uh, from recreation, I think you'll find more uh, individual efforts. Hi, this is Jasmine, um, a fellow pharmacist. Um, I was wondering if you had any data on your incidence of hypoglycemia amongst your populations. I'm so excited that you asked that question. So again, as we're looking um, to build, get a work smarter, work with our system a little bit. Um, I do have a little bit of an idea, but again, the data that I can pull out is only as good as the data that goes in. And so I ran a report for my own institution to see how many uh, how many events we had coded as a hypoglycemic emergency in the last six months, and I came up with 16. And I think that's about right. I had another uh, individual run one for a different institution um, who came up with one, but thanks to the pharmacist data at that same institution was able to tell me that they had documented from the pharmacy standpoint that there were uh, 26 events. Um, so it's a challenge, I think, anywhere you are for, you know, making sure that the data is going into the system uh, in a way that makes it uh, useful. Um, but we're definitely um, getting there. And if it puts the, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, if it puts it into context a little bit, the, the institution that had 26 events, it was 26 events from about 215 patients. This is uh, Sherry Bowen. I just had what you know, given your knowledge of the of the system overall, and, and there there is variation across sites. Where do you see as some um, real opportunities for improvement, or do you see anything in terms of standardization or or opportunity for improvement for diabetes prevention and management? I, I'm afraid that I would take up too much of the uh, the board's time if I went to everything. Um, but yes, I think uh, I think we could have slightly more standardization in our prevention uh, education. Perhaps we could um, work towards that where we do have some institutions that are similar to each other. For example, I'm at a, a federal medical center. There are seven of us. Um, and that represents a large part of the burden of diabetes because we tend to have the more complex patients. But then again, um, wouldn't it be amazing if at our, what we would call our care level two institutions, if we were able to um, look towards things like optimizing metformin use um, so that we're, you know, um, not getting into, you know, the, the burden of insulin. Um, and then, again, with a more of, more of, again, of an approach of, of prevention there. All my own opinions, of course. This is John Boultry. Um, is every prisoner screened for diabetes and prediabetes if they're not known to have that previously? We follow uh, pretty much what you would find in the American Diabetes Association uh, guidance for screening. So, you know, if you have a very, uh, we do often have some very young um, individuals coming in with no existing risk factors, and we may not necessarily screen universally in those cases. But um, I find that we are. I think you. I think we would find it. We're we're pretty good at um, following the the stated guidance on screening. And do you thank you? And do you share um, the same electronic health record among all the prisons? Great question. Yes, certainly an advantage. Thank you. Yes, we have many unique opportunities. Again, you know, our insulin is a directly observed therapy. So if we have patients who are having issues with adherence, that's 
information that's pretty readily available to us so that we can address that, uh, you know, in a, in a patient appointment and having a conversation about what the barriers are. Dr. Alou, this is Paula. I have a question. Uh, when someone is released from the prison, what is the follow-up or the handover for their care when they come back into the community? That's an excellent question. So I can tell you, you know, from the pharmacy standpoint, we always make sure to that the patient has at least a 30-day supply of medication, and if that includes insulin, that will include uh, syringes as well. Um, to make sure that they can administer that. Um, and then we have a wonderful teams of social workers and caseworkers who assist uh, patients, you know, prior to their release, they're looking at, okay, where are you going? Um, what, what health services are available to you? You know, do you have veteran status, for example? Um, what can we do to make sure that you're having a smooth transition back into the community? Thank you. All right. Well, I'm not hearing other questions. Thank you for the six or seven people who did have questions for Dr. Alu. And Dr. Alu, thank you so much for providing us a window into the kind of work that Bureau of Prisons is doing in terms of diabetes management. I'm sure there will be other questions, and we know just the person to whom we should reach. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> All right, well, we're a few minutes early here. Let's go ahead and move on to our next agency presentation. This comes from the Food and Drug Administration from the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. This 20-minute session will be co-presented uh, first by Dr. William Chong, who is the Acting Deputy Director in the Division of Metabolism and Endocrinology Products. And he will be followed by Dr. Christine Lee, a health scientist in the same center for FDA. Bill and Christine. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so as Dr. Powell mentioned, I'm William Chong. I'm the acting deputy director for the Division of Metabolism and Endocrinology Products in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. My colleague Christine Lee and I will be providing an overview of the Food and Drug Administration and its diabetes-related activities. The next slide. Uh, so I've Standard disclaimer for FDA presentations. This presentation reflects the views of the presenters, should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policies. Next slide. So FDA's mission is, encompasses a wide range of things. Um, this includes ensuring the safety and efficacy of drugs, biological products, and medical devices, ensuring the safety of the food supply, cosmetics, and radiation-emitting products, regulating the manufacturing, marketing, and distribution of tobacco products, and helping to speed innovation by helping the public get the accurate science-based information needed to use medical products and foods to maintain and improve their health. We can move to the next slide. So our headquarters is located in Silver Spring, Maryland. Next slide. But we also have a presence throughout the United States and around the world. Some of FDA's regional offices are shown here, and our global presence helps to ensure the quality of the food and medical products that U.S. consumers and patients use. Next. So as you can see in this rather complex organizational chart, FDA as an organization consists of several offices. For the purposes of today's presentation, I'm going to focus on one, next, which is the Office of Medical Products and Tobacco. Next slide. More specifically, I'm going to be highlighting the activity that occurs within two centers of that office. Next, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, where uh, Christine Lee and I work, and the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. I'm going to be focusing on these two, uh, mainly because much of the FDA's diabetes-related activities occurs through these two centers. Next slide. So the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, uh, sometimes referred to as CEDAR, has a stated mission to protect and promote public health by helping to ensure that human drugs are safe and effective for their intended use, that they meet established quality standards, and that they are available to patients. Next slide. Uh, among the ways that CEDAR achieves this goal, is through the regulation of drug products. This includes drugs to improve glycemic control, such as semaglutide, insulin decludac, and ergoflozin. Next, this also includes drugs to treat complications of diabetes, such as ranibizumab and aflibercept, which are approved for the treatment of diabetic retinopathy. Next. More recently, we've also approved glucose-lowering drugs, such as liraglutide and empagliflozin, which can also reduce the risk for cardiovascular events in patients with diabetes and established cardiovascular disease. Next. And lastly, as part of ensuring the safety of these products, Theater continues to conduct ongoing monitoring for post-marketing safety signals. Next slide. The Center for Devices and Radiological Health, or CDRH, 
has a similar mission to CEDAR. Their stated mission is to protect and promote public health by assuring that patients and providers have timely access to safe, effective, and high-quality medical devices and safe radiation-emitting products. Next slide. Similar to what I did with uh, discussing the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, I'm going to go through a few examples of things that the Center for Devices regulates that are pertinent to patients with diabetes. So these include things like the drug delivery devices that patients use, uh, such as insulin pumps and insulin syringes. Next. This also includes diabetes monitoring devices, like continuous glucose monitors and the blood glucose monitors. Next. Other products that are also regulated by CDRH include those for the treatment of diabetes complications, like the YAG laser for retinal photocoagulation. Next. And devices and tests for the detection and diagnosis of diabetes and its complications. An example of this is the IDXDR software, which is used in combination with um, retinal photography to diagnose and detect diabetic retinopathy. Next, like CEDAR, CDRH also conducts ongoing monitoring to detect post-marketing safety signals for the regulated products. Next slide. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, part of FDA's mission is to help the public get accurate science-based information that is needed to use medical products and foods to maintain and improve their health. FDA has several tools to communicate with the public, and I'm going to touch on a few of them here. Next. So the first of these are um, term press releases. So FDA issues press releases to communicate significant actions. These can include approvals of novel therapies or raising awareness of new information or findings. Next. Safety communications are another tool that FDA uses to communicate with the public. Uh, as this as the name implies, safety communications are used to communicate safety information. This is generally post-marketing information and is meant to provide new or updated information about emerging risks. Next, FDA is also active on Twitter and has several Twitter handles that they use to disseminate information. Next, and FDA also produces and publishes consumer and patient resources. In the next few slides, I'm going to go through some of these, some diabetes-related examples for each of these. Next slide. Um, so, in the next several slides, we'll have a couple examples of FDA press releases. Uh, the first was uh, released in 2016 uh, when FDA approved the first automated insulin delivery device. This device combined an insulin pump with a continuous glucose monitor to allow for automated titration of basal insulin dosing. Next, also in 2016, FDA approved a new indication for empagliflozin. This was the first glucose-lowering drug to receive an indication to reduce cardiovascular events specifically cardiovascular death. Next, in 2017, FDA approved an insulin Lispro product under an abbreviated development program. This was the first short-acting follow-on insulin and was expected to increase competition in the market and hopefully provide lower-cost alternatives to patients. Next, so uh, in this slide and the next slide, I'll show two examples of FDA safety communications. The first example is a 2015 communication that warns against sharing multi-dose insulin pens, even if the needle is changed, as there was found to be a risk of transmitting bloodborne infections. Next slide. Uh, Another 2015 safety communication um, was issued to alert patients and prescribers to the risk of ketoacidosis with sodium glucose cotransporter 2 inhibitors. This adverse reaction was identified in the post-marketing setting and is now included in the prescribing information for all members of this drug class. Next slide. So I'm going to turn now to FDA's social media presence. As I mentioned, FDA has several Twitter handles. The main Twitter handle is the the sitting top line there is US FDA and has more than 200,000 followers. Different offices within FDA also utilize social media like Twitter to communicate to their target audiences and communicate different topics. And the current commissioner also has his own Twitter account. Uh, What you're here on the on the left, right side of the screen is um, an example of some kind of, of the kind of information that can be uh, disseminated by FDA through Twitter, such as reminders about safe food handling. Next. Okay. So the last thing I want to cover before turning over to Christine Lee um, are some of the examples of FDA's consumer and patient resources. Uh, so, I have two short videos from FDA's YouTube channel that are targeted at patients with diabetes. The first is about women with diabetes. So, let me get the volume working. 
Know the name of your medicine, how much you should take and when, and how it can affect the other medicines you're taking, including your birth control. Ask your doctor to explain any side effects like headaches, upset stomach, weight gain, or dizziness. Work with your doctor, nurse, or pharmacist to make a plan to use your medicine safely. For more information on diabetes medicines, go to fda.gov slash women's diabetes. And the second video I have is on the topic of health care, health fraud scams. Hello, friends, patients. Dr. Yeah. Barry back again. We're talking about a very important subject. Type 2 diabetes. Sounds too good to be true. I can eat with him. Sorry. Uh, let's try that one more time. You can really eat that? I thought you were diabetic. Yeah. But I just got these pills. They're supposed to work like insulin. Found them on the Internet. Sound too good to be true. I can eat whatever I want. Look, it says so right there on the bottom. Mm, that's not good. Ever get the feeling you've been had? How can you spot health products? Look for bold product claims, personal testimonials, and a host of promises. There are many other red flags, and we'll tell you all you need to know. We're the FDA. Don't be a victim of health fraud scams. Be smart. Be aware. Be careful. For more information on how to spot health fraud scams, visit fda.gov slash health fraud. So I think that uh, that is my portion. Um, I want to now turn the presentation over to Dr. Christine Lee, who will be talking about uh, FDA's activities in the National Action Plan and some of the uh, research that is supported by FDA. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, next slide, please. So as you may know, there was the AD National Action Plan that was released a couple years ago that really asked the federal government and public and private sector to really focus on the three major drug classes that were implicated in over 60% of emergency room visits for average drug events for the older population, including diabetic agents. Next slide, please. The National Action Plan was really a catalyst for call to action. Within the National Action Plan, there was a call for dissemination of information as well as implementation of research to patient-centered care around the issues of hypoglycemia. Next slide, please. As you can see here, Leveraging FDA partnerships in action is key to really address hypoglycemia within this older population. Next slide, please. I'm going to go over just very briefly two to three examples of what the FDA has done around amplification of the message for hypoglycemia adverse drug events, as well as implementation of research. Next slide, please. An example of amplification of the message of hypoglycemia, including individualizing glycemic goals, addressing food insecurity, understanding hypoglycemia, bringing awareness of hypoglycemia, the FDA collaborated with the ADA Endocrine Society to amplify this message. This was done through Twitter chat over Diabetes Month on hypoglycemia including creation of a key infographic and key messages on hypoglycemia with the Endocrine Society for clinicians, publications, and also in September 12, 2017, the FDA put out a public workshop addressing hypoglycemia in the older population. This public workshop was then highlighted within a Medscape article. Next slide, please. Understanding to take research off the shelf and actually implement it and understanding how to use research in the best way possible, we looked at two different types of research. One was social media listening, understanding what people are talking about on social media around diabetes and hypoglycemia. And number two, understanding through collaboration, we can implement FDA-funded research. Next slide, please. One of the examples that we have here to take research off the shelf and actually implement it at the patient level is shown here. 
Through the Broad Agency Announcement, or BAA, we funded Kaiser Permanente to develop a hypoglycemia risk stratification tool. Besides it being published, which is a traditional method to increase knowledge as seen at the top bar, we also partnered with CMS TCPI, or Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, to really have the research hit the clinical level. We captured emergency room visits hypoglycemia. We implemented the Kaiser risk stratification tool into the Mayo Clinic, and we measured outcomes, and then we're in the process of replicating success. We hope to reach the 140,000 clinicians that CMS TCPI reaches. Next slide, please. I'm going to go over very briefly on our social media listening project to try to understand what people are saying on social media. Next slide, please. Um, maybe click through this. The purpose of the study was to really understand what we can learn from unstructured data. The FDA collects unstructured data through advisory committee transcripts, through docket comments, and other available sources that people can put their stories into. Also, on social media. The purpose of this research was to understand what people are saying through unstructured data sources and also seeing if we can overlap the data to increase the confidence of the data presented. Next slide, please. We used a web scraping tool to really understand what people are saying on social media. The next few slides just very briefly highlight some of the areas that we were able to tap into using this web scraping tool. Next slide, please. As you can see, there is many discussions around type 2 diabetes, pregnancy, heart disease, and other um, conversations. Next slide, please. And next slide. We were then able to take the materials found on social media and data dump it into a qualitative research software in which we were then able to use qualitative research methods to further mine the discussions. As you can see here, this is the cyclical step to coding that was used to mine the materials um, from the web. Next slide, please. The results showed that there were four salient themes that emerged from the analysis of Facebook posts. It showed personal experiences of people living with diabetes and how diet and exercise can help patients in the management of diabetes. It also showed that it was important to be aware of comorbid conditions, teasing out symptomology. Additionally, there were indirect links to diabetes and health factors in the built environment, including household, diet, and other factors placed in visual risk at developing diabetes. Also, the importance of patient support encouraging community engagement to support healthier environments. As you can see, that the, this further emphasizes the importance of addressing patient-centered approach and individualizing care. One size does not fit all. Next slide, please. However, as with all studies, there are challenges and limitations. Some of the challenges with social media data mining include inconsistencies around how social media data is utilized for research purposes. Social media posts are often fragmented and communication is not focused. It was never created for research. It's usually unstructured and open-ended. Also, there's a lack of clarity surrounding how social media can be effectively utilized to identify common themes and further support public health initiatives. Information that should be considered when mining social media data include how would the data be utilized? What can the agency do to enhance social media engagement? What social media platforms would be most informative to explore? Is it Twitter, Facebook, or Reddit? Are there certain segments of the population that use certain social media platforms more than others? And are there novel ways that can be piloted to further engage with the public in an effort to better capture the patient's voice? Next slide, please. 
key points here is that qualitative research is interpretive and contextual. It's important to know how qualitative research methods can be rigorously applied to analyze social media. Also, knowledge of the key elements of the approach is critical, and effective utilization has the potential to strengthen our ability to effectively tackle public health problems. Next slide, please. The takeaway points from here is that it's important to know how qualitative research methods can be rigorously applied to analyze social media data. Also, implementation of research into clinical practice is significant and available. For example, with our collaboration with CMS TCPI, we were able to implement FDA-funded research beyond um, the traditional method of publication. Next slide, please. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Christine and Bill. Um, we have some time for questions to be entertained by the commission. Yeah, hi, this is Dean Schillinger. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, that was a really terrific uh, set of presentations from the FDA. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I run a health communications research program at the University of California, San Francisco, so I'm particularly interested in the second presentation, and um, I'm very excited to see the FDA um, harnessing social media to um, help inform its work. Um, one of the more exciting things that, that we have learned um, from social media, in addition to some of the surveillance um, work that um, you and others have been doing, is that um, from a linguistic standpoint, the way people are talking about the problem of interest can really provide um, uh, important opportunities for us to think about how to frame uh, and communicate around the problem of interest. It also can provide um, an interesting platform to uh, iteratively test different um, uh, forms of framing and communication. Have, have you all done any work in this regard, um, either in the diabetes space or, or other areas? Um, yes, actually, that is a really good point, and that is something that we also found, that through social media listening, it is a way for hypothesis generation, for signal generation. Um, by itself, we tend not to use it in isolation, but currently what we are doing is that we are overlapping social media data with FDA archival data to further increase our confidence in the data. Yeah. This is this is Naomi. Oh, go ahead. No, I just wanted to ask. So, do you have like a, a panel, or have you engaged social media panels to um, to serve as uh, a panel to provide feedback for um, you know sets of messages that you want to compare in terms of their resonance and uptake? Uh, so you're saying like you know is there any like focus group testing? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you could do focus group testing uh, through social media. There also are social media um, companies, I guess, who you know have 20,000 people signed up who every day check their account and can choose whether they want to participate in a uh, quote unquote study or feedback to to generators of of content. Uh, you know that. Yeah. At a relatively low cost. Well, I personally have not done that yet, um, but I'm not sure if anyone else in the agency has done that, but that is a really good point. Yeah, I mean, they basically enroll what they call representative populations, and obviously anyone on, on the Internet is not necessarily representative of the entire population, but they do try to, to enroll a diverse ethnically diverse population and diverse in terms of income and education. That's a really great point. I think the first phase of this research project was to really understand how to best increase the scientific rigor of unstructured social media data, which a lot of times is very messy. And sure. what we have found through just web scraping, a lot of it tends to be more around the humorous line. For example, they would say things like, ha, 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 I have diabetes, I ate a dozen donuts. So the cleaning of the data takes a lot of time. Then the coding of it, just increasing 
the specificity and sensitivity of our techniques that has been our focus. We haven't really spent a lot of time on the communication end, but that is a great idea. Great. Well, happy to chat with you offline if that's something you guys are interested in doing. Absolutely. There are two Christine Lees, though, at the FDA, just so you know. <clears throat> so this is Naomi Sukagawa at the USDA. In your mining of the data, did anything come up relative to diet or specific foods? Um, we are in the process of trying to segment out the data through social media. It's rather difficult. We wanted to look at for example, the Hispanic population or the African-American population or the Native American population to see whether or not the foods were something that they talked about that had an influence on their disease state. We have found, though, that we would have to use a verified online patient population in order to do that, um, but there is mentions around food. We also have found that for social media, the conversations tend to be richest around two types of disease states. The first one is if it's a stigmatized disease state, for example, schizophrenia, opioids, depression. The second type is around rare diseases. These two types of categories tend to give us the richest information since people tend to then flock to social media to talk about you know, their day-to-day -day issues, including culture, diet, et cetera. But around diabetes, less so. What about obesity? You know, that was also a great idea, and that was something that we were planning on doing. I am... Um, just one person, unfortunately, and I think I only have like a few people helping me. So I do plan on expanding this work. It's just rather limited with personnel. We'll have to do interagency agreements. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm like, I'm like, I feel like I just want to replicate myself. Yeah, thank you. This is Bill Herman. I wondered if um, Bill could you comment a little bit on the problems with bringing biosimilars to market, and, and one of the missions seems to be to make drugs available to patients. Does that get into the issue of cost at all? So this is uh, so Dr. Herman, this is Bill Chong. Um, so there are two parts in your question that, from as my understanding. So the first is uh, challenges in bringing biosimilars to market. So um, that's, a, that's actually a broad scientific question that the agency has been working towards resolving. Some of the issues there um, are scientific issues. Some of the issues there are um, legal regulatory issues. But um, the FDA is engaged and interested in bringing more products, um, more biosimilars, more generic products to the market um, with the hope that it will increase competition and ultimately drive prices down and improve patient access to the needed medication. And if, does FDA have anything to do directly with pricing or not? FDA does not have anything to do with pricing. Thanks. And tobacco is under FDA's domain as well. Um, can you briefly speak to that? So tobacco is a relatively new addition to FDA's regulatory uh, authorities. Um, you, uh, Dr. Gottlieb, our current commissioner, has been very active in um, in trying to uh, provide additional regulations sort on tobacco products. I don't know all the details of sort of the activities that are going on in the um, tobacco arena. Uh, if it's something that is of interest, um, I can try to look into that and get a little more information if you have specific questions. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you to Dr. Chong and Dr. Lee for an interesting presentation for, from the FDA and also to our commissioners, our commission members um, for the questions um, back to them. Let's go ahead and stay on schedule. Our next presentation is by Dr. Donald Schell, who is the Director of Disease Prevention 
Disease Management and Population Health Policy and Oversight at the Health Services Policy and Oversight um, Office within the Department of Defense. And uh, Dr. Shell will talk about diabetes uh, in the Department of Defense. Dr. Shell. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And if we can go to the next slide. Um, for, for our limited time today, uh, we're just going to talk about the plethora of things that are involved with the Department of Defense. Um, as we know that, if you go to the next slide, it's fine. Um, our military health system, just in preparation, uh, we have here our bottom line up front, with our, our bluff, our approach to diabetes. We have about 14,500 active duty service members by our, some of our most recent numbers and about 176,000 beneficiaries. Just for clarification, the military health system, um, large health system, uh, we delivered the services to about 9.4 million eligible patients, including beneficiaries, across about 700 military hospitals around the world. Of that 9.4 million eligible individuals, include active duty service members and their beneficiaries, we currently have at the end of 2018 about 1.3 million active duty service members, um, and including the 42,000 from the Coast Guard. Um, and so from that perspective, we have a small number, 14,500 of active duty, about 176,000 beneficiaries. Um, as an employer, um, as DOD is a provider of care and an employer um, with our job as a defendant nation, diabetes is, uh, pre-existing diabetes is a disqualifier for a prospective recruit who wants to assess into the military. But we do care for our active duty service members who are diagnosed with diabetes after enlistment and is not necessarily to qualify, to disqualify it once you're already enlisted in the service. We do have our chronic disease policies and procedures that include the management of all of our chronic diseases, including diabetes. And DOD and the VA um, have existing evidence-based practice work groups, and we have a clinical practice guideline that was developed to improve diabetes outcomes and addresses the relationship between care options, health options, and looks at the evidence and the strength of treatment recommendations. But next slide. In addressing diabetes, then within our military health system, as I mentioned before, we in our instructions, we have a DODI stands for Department of Defense Instruction. We have instruction numbers that specifically address each of our diseases and chronic disorders that are qualifying or disqualifying. Our active duty service members present with an incidence of about 82 cases per 100,000, um, and we had about 9,000 cases reported from um, 2008 to 2015. And the references are at the bottom of the slide. The first reference is from our Military Surveillance Medical Report Journal, which I'll, which I'll come back to in a few slides. Our non-active duty service men and women, uh, 45 years and older, enrolled in TRICARE, um, have a higher prevalence of diabetes compared with our service members who are generally younger. Gestational by diabetes, about 6.3% of our active duty service women between 2012 and 2016, which is kind of consistent with the range of, uh, that we see reported by our colleagues and um, at the CDC. We have our uh, active duty service members who do become or are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes after accessing in the military, and type 2 is the most common, and uh, men, incidence in men is about twice as high in women. Next slide. So from an uh, overview of our um, ethnic and racial background, we do find that Type 2 diabetes is most common in our black, non-Hispanic service members, uh, and then the other categories, service members who otherwise are unknown race or ethnicity, and as mentioned in our um, Hispanic service members. So our black, and his, black non-Hispanic, and Hispanic service members have the highest uh, rates of diabetes. Next slide. This is uh, some information compared. This is a little older information back from uh, 1998, and we'll just use it for a point of comparison. This is from the uh, document I mentioned earlier, which is the um, MSMR um, journal for the military. And it shows the incidence of diabetes mellitus back in 1998. And we can see that um, we have an age uh, relationship um, with a direct relationship with age, as especially once you reach the age of 35, uh, the rates are much higher um, amongst men and they're elevated in women also. Um, we do also see on the table one on the right side, that if we look at uh, we look at race and ethnicity, we see again the increased uh, rate in our black and Asian and uh, other populations in comparison to um, our white population and uh, even in this one our Hispanic one was a little lower at that time. Um, and we also see uh, an increase with age 
as most of our service members are more than likely under the age of 40. We do have some uh, more senior, older service members, but for the military's perspective, um, I'm, I'm ancient from military age in my age, but a lot of our service members are in the younger age category. Next slide, please. A little more recent information. Um, last slide was, was 1998. This is 2008 to 2015. And the uh, MSMR, Military Surveillance uh, Journal, again, uh, revisited this issue again with some publicly facing information with our incidence of diabetes. And once again, over on the right side, we have type 1, uh, 3 per 100,000 person years, two times greater in men. Uh, once again, uh, this will illustrate an indirect relationship with age, unlike the type 2 diabetes, which is higher, 74.5 per 100,000, almost twice as high as men. And if you look on the left side on the table, uh, once again, we find that the incidence rate is higher. Um, when we look at our type 2, we focus on type 2 in the middle. The type 2 diabetes, we find that our incidence uh, increases as we, uh, in a linear relationship, as we increase with age, men are higher than women. And once again, down at the bottom of the table, uh, we see again both for incidents with type 2 diabetes, which um, is much higher for our black, uh, non-Hispanic, and also for races that are otherwise unknown with Hispanic men in the third category. Next slide. Uh, comparing this again to uh, a little more recent information, our incidence of diabetes on the right side of the slide in active duty service members uh, were lower than our 1998 data, and we had a decrease in a marked decrease from 2010 to 2015. Our lowest, the blue line on the bottom, represents type 1 diabetes, and then uh, type 2 um, is the red line, and we see our numbers have dropped since 2010, as reported in our journal. Uh, next slide. So with our diabetes quality of care, TRICARE um, screening improved, and so we try to think about what, what are some of the reasons why uh, potentially our numbers dropped, and I can't explain 100% why, but um, I'll share a couple of thoughts. Um, our TRICARE screening improved and is approaching NCQA benchmarks for the 50th and 75th percentiles. Uh, we increased 2.8% of our military treatment facilities since 2012, and I had some slight increases in, in DOD and in our purchase care sites in 2014. And so the bottom, um, which is showing our track here, reported information for our diabetes uh, hemoglobin A1C screening with our HEDIS measures focusing on annual testing um, with our providers. And so we um, had some modest gains, um, and uh, we'll continue to work in that effort. Uh, next slide. So for our policies for DOD, I mentioned uh, DOD has directives and we have issuances, and from our perspective, um, all of our service members are responsible for and are beholden to our directives and issuances, and for the military, it's to, so the services are ready. Um, we have health care services to support the members of the armed forces, and I'll just particularly focus on our active duty service members for the moment. Um, we have our directives and our policies that establish our medical and physical standards for both appointment, enlistment, and induction into the services and into the academies. Uh, our directives and policies institute our criteria for evaluations, um, and most of it is centered around the ability for service members to be able to deploy. We have a number of different documents that I have listed there. Um, in order to determine if a service member, active duty service member is diagnosed and can be retained, uh, we have something called the Medical Examination Review Board and a Physical Examination Board, and an active duty service member who's diagnosed may be referred to one of those boards for an evaluation to determine if their chronic disease is still compatible with service. We do have education and training on diabetes available to all the services. Um, we have the Air Force Diabetes Center of Excellence, and then we have uh, management of diabetes in, in our primary care, and we both follow the VA, VA DOD clinical guidelines, clinical practice guidelines. Next slide. So a little bit of elaborate, a couple of slides on the clinical practice guideline between the DOD and the VA. Um, you know, in the first presentation, there was a discussion about uh, handing off care when an individual leaves one population to go to another population. In DOD, there's been a lot of um, direction um, from Congress and the Senate about the handoff and the collaboration between DOD and the, and the VA, and we've been working very hard uh, with our colleagues at the VA. This diabetes um, clinical practice guideline management 
with both the DOD and the VA was established in 2004. The mission was to advise the HEC, the Health Executive Council, on the use of clinical epidemiological evidence to improve the health of our populations across both the VA and the military health system. That was based on a systematic review of both clinical and epidemiological evidence, and this multidisciplinary panel of ex- experts uh, just documented a clear explanation of the logistical relationships between care options, health outcomes, while rating the quality of each evidence and the strength of the recommendation. Next slide. And I'll give a little bit more information, detail about that. So this practice, uh, clinical practice guideline for the DOD and the VA, evidence-based practice guidelines assisting our providers, including diagnostic treatment and follow-up recommendations, reducing the risk of preventable complications, improving the quality of life, emphasizes shared decision-making to establish patient goals, promotes uh, assessing patients on a case-by-case basis as an individual, a collaboration between the patient and their diabetes treatment outcome goals we know all know is critical, also provides the criteria for the diagnosis of diabetes and prediabetes, identifies the risk factors, placing someone at a higher risk for type 2, and it addresses and identifies epidemiological aspects and the impact of diabetes for both the individuals and our population. Next slide. Also, this clinical practice guideline uh, addresses some of the key issues, key questions of clinical relevance, importance, and the interest for the management of our uh, diabetes, diabetic service members. It includes a grading system uh, that includes the development and evaluation or grade, grading of recommendations, assessment, development, and evaluation to identify the quality of the evidence and to assign a grade for strength for each recommendation. This is intended to give our practitioners a general guide for best practices to assist providers and considers a recommendation for the use in the context of the provider's clinical judgment and uh, in the face of our individual patient values and preferences. Next slide. So this uh, four domains included um, assessing the strength of recommendations in this grade system that I mentioned, confidence in the quality of the evidence, balance of desirable and undesirable outcomes, and um, of course, again, patient or provider values and preferences, implications as appropriate, uh, looks at resources, equity, acceptability, feasibility of the subgroup considerations, and so it's a similar grading system such as the USPS uh, TF uses two domains, uh, certainty of the benefit, magnitude of the benefit, balancing against benefit and harms, which may result, um, which may impact the recommendations. And we use this great systems used in the VA, VA DOD guidelines to determine the relative strength of each recommendation as either strong um, or weak recommendation. Next slide. So in looking at this then, we uh, established this direction for recommendations either for or against. A recommendation for therapy or preventative measure indicates that the desirable consequences outweigh the undesirable consequence. A recommendation against in the case of the undesirable consequence outweighs the desirable one. So for example, uh, we have a grade of each recommendation that's presented and I use the colors just to help, uh, help look at the flow. So for something, strong for, is something that we recommend offering. Week four, you suggest offering, but if we're against it, we're either weakly or strongly against it. Weakly, it suggests not, and strongly is a recommendation against providing any particular therapy. And I added the colors uh, just for the sake of the presentation. Next slide. So from our recommendations, uh, and I think uh, there's a couple of closeout slides. So if we look at general approach to type two diabetes care, uh, we have strong evidence for recommend shared decision making, recommend that all patients with diabetes should be offered ongoing individualized self management education via different modalities tailored to their preferences, learning needs, and abilities. And then we have weak evidence uh, in the clinical practice guidelines suggesting offering one or more different types of bi directional telehealth interventions, um, health communications via computer, telephone, involving licensed independent practitioners selected by primary care providers. So it's a recommendation for, but not as strong as the other two. Uh, next slide. With our glycemic control targets and monitoring, strong for setting A1, hemoglobin A1C target range based on absolute, absolute risk reduction, uh, preventing microvascular complications, increasing life expectancy. Um, we are second number five here, developing an individualized glycemic management plan based on the provider's appraisal of the risk to benefit ratio strong for recommending assessing each patient's characteristics, race, age, ethnicity, uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, non-glycemic factors, 
um, and interpreting their results and uh, other factors for biomarkers. Recommending number seven, an individualized target range, taking into account the preferences, presence or absence of microvascular complications, and the presence or severity of comorbid conditions. And then week four, uh, suggesting the range of hemoglobin A1C um, with a life expectancy of someone 10 to 15 years or greater, absent any mild uh, complications, uh, but it has to be done safely. Next slide. Looking again uh, under continued under glycemic control, recommending the range of hemoglobin A1C, which is appropriate, strong for, but weekly, uh, number 10, suggesting a target range for patients with type 2 diabetes with a life expectancy of less than five years, significant comorbidities and or complications of diabetes or difficulties in self-management. And we look at uh, mental status, disability, other factors such as food insecurity, insufficient social support, and uh, suggesting that providers be aware of H1, A1C variability for complications related related to microvascular and micro macrovascular outcomes. Under our non-pharmacological treatments, uh, recommendations for strong for number 12, 13, and 14, therapeutic lifestyle changes, Mediterranean diet, and nutritional interventions uh, reducing the percent of, of carbohydrate consumption um, and daily calories if for someone who doesn't choose a Mediterranean diet. Next slide. Uh, for inpatient care, um, recommendations against uh, um, targeting glucose levels lower than 110. Um, uh, number 16, uh, strong four, insulin to be adjusted to maintain glucose between particular levels, especially in patients with type 2 diabetes. We have strong against split mixed insulin, and I won't go through all of these in detail, but um, we have week four um, for recommendations for our inpatient treatment, and so providers can take use these uh, to help direct their care. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have selected complications and conditions, and we have three strong four on the top. Um, foot assessments, um, um, referring patients with limb-threatening conditions, appropriate level of care, and uh, dilated fundoscopic retinal exam, of course, is strongly recommended. We have a weak suggestion for um, screening for retinopathy at least every other year um, for patients that have no retinopathy in all previous examinations. Uh, next slide. And then I think we're coming to a close with these. Uh, for selected comp complications, again, in conditions, too strong for recommend that all females with pre-existing diabetes and a personal history of diabetes of reproductive potential be uh, provided contraceptive options for education and um, the benefit of optimizing the glycemic control before they conceive, and that females with pre-existing diabetes and the history of diabetes um, planning pregnancy be educated about the safest option to manage your diabetes during their pregnancy and to see MFM, maternal fetal medicine provider, uh, before or as soon as possible once the pregnancy is confirmed. Uh, next slide. And so our takeaways, um, you know, it's important uh, for the care that we provide, um, shared decision-making, um, awareness, education, individualized care, facilitates treatment and management, understanding the risk factors enables early detection, manage, control diabetes, and lead to improved screening and health care for active duty service members and their beneficiaries. You know, as an agency, we want to remain up to date on our policies, procedures, guidance, and research and evidence so that we provide best practices across the enterprise. And then the DOD, uh, VA, VA DOD evidence-based practice work group developed to improve our outcomes by addressing that relationship uh, between care and health and outcomes and rating the quality of the evidence and providing some direction to our providers across the uh, both agencies. Uh, next slide. And that's my last slide, and I'll uh, take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Shell, for a comprehensive presentation about um, your work. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes here for questions. I'd like to open that up to the committee. Uh, this is John Boltry. Um, what diabetes prevention programs do you have for active duty um, personnel, and how do those vary depending on where in the world uh, they might be situated? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, each of the services have uh, approaches to diabetes. I don't believe we have one. We have DPP um, offered exactly the way it's presented by the CDC, but we have uh, – we have our patient-centered medical homes. Uh, we may use a different term for them, but we have our patient-centered medical homes. We have a number of nutrition initiatives and 
for an individual where nutrition is an issue where it is identified with diabetes, they prefer, they're provided referrals to the nutritionist. So we might not have a, um, a baked um, preformed diabetes program available to all service members across around the globe because our, our, um, we have 700 military hospitals and clinics around the world, and I don't want to misclassify exactly what's available at every location, um, but all of our active duty service members are eligible to receive care. Sometimes the limitations with service members who are experiencing a chronic disease, some of the limitations associated with their ability to serve um, are based on what care is available in that particular environment. That environment is dictated by their service they're in and their military operational specialty, their MLS. And so um, someone with a chronic disease such as diabetes, whether it's type 1 or type 2, that requires more frequent monitoring is not going to be able to deploy in a setting where there's no fixed uh, medical facility available. They may have to stay at a larger base or a hospital facility, which will have all the usual um, support and clinical programs available. I don't want to misrepresent and say we do have uh, um, DPP programs around the globe, which is, I don't want to misrepresent, do or don't, but the service members who need access to diabetes and other supportive, obesity, physical activity, care, counseling, education, nutrition, um, they'll receive it, but it might be in a different format. DOD is under the role now of transitioning to the Defense Health Agency, and the Defense Health Agency um, and we've been directed to unite our care for all of the services under the Defense Health Agency. And as the Defense Health Agency matures, I think it's in its second or third year now, but it's just assumed control of about um, 12 different MTFs in October 1st. And so things that have been done separately by the services for the last 200 years are slowly being morphed into um, one system under the Defense Health Agency. So. Uh, maybe within the next year or two, I'll, I'll be able to give you more of a solid response about one approach that's taken across the whole enterprise. Thank you. Um, just one quick follow-up question. Is the VA un under the Defense Health Agency, too? No. Oh, boy. No, no. Um, no, the VA is a separate, separate agency. Um, we, we have been directed by Congress and the Senate to um, utilize our resources effectively between the two organizations. And so our clinical practice guidelines are developed together, and uh, they are in the process now of working on uh, having both same uh, electronic health record systems. And so the goal is to have a seamless care transition between DOD and the VA. And uh, I know there are a lot of people working very hard, both on the DOD and the VA side, to, to make sure that seamless care is achieved. So when the active duty service member becomes a vet, access to the same records, same standards, same quality of care, and that they don't miss a beat in the transition between the two. Thank you. And Bill Herman again, does DOD have policies and programs for tobacco? Oh, yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, we do. Those fall under uh, our, our DOTI, uh Department of Defense Instruction 1010.10, and um, we just revised that recently. That falls into my portfolio, but we do have uh, we do have tobacco policies. Yes, yeah. and I would assume they discourage tobacco use. <laughs> are there are there prohibitions, or I mean, how stringent are they? Um, well, as a as a, and I'm just you know not not giving my my own personal comments and thoughts about tobacco, but um, as a uh, legal substance that's utilized um, and available for purchase across our great land. Um, service members are free to use tobacco. There are some um, environmental restrictions and things that we have baked into our, our processes, but um, tobacco use and choice is a personal use for the individual, and uh, they're managed and appropriately. There have been changes made in our tobacco policy for um, comparability and pricing and availability, and so I know this call is not about tobacco, but uh, the department has made some efforts to level the playing field and make tobacco less attractive to purchase and uh, commissaries and on installations uh, to try to use the pricing approach to decrease in the, the availability of products. Okay. But this is Dean Schellinger, but you, you can, one can purchase tobacco products on, uh, in, in military bases and commissaries. You don't have to go off 
there, there aren't sort of workplace setting interventions related to um, to banning tobacco sales? Uh, no, tobacco purchase is definitely available on installations and probably more of the opposite from what you said. We had individuals coming off the base who can access the base and the commissary to purchase. I got but it. We've, uh, we've leveled the playing field so to take away the incentive for someone traveling to an installation and, and uh, kind of stocking up on tobacco and going back home. That, that, that uh, incentive has been uh, dramatically reduced to equal the price in the market wherever that uh, installation is located. Thank you, gentlemen, for this uh, interesting Q&A. I think we need to close the questions for this session. Um, perhaps remaining questions can be dealt with in the discussion period at the end of our meeting. Let's go on to the next presenter. Uh, this is Dr. Naomi Fukagawa. From, she is the director of the Beltsville Human Nutrition Research Center at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And Dr. Fukugawa is going to talk about USDA's consideration for food supply, food choice, and food policy. Thank you, Clyde. And I will apologize to the group if I get into a coughing fit because I lost the battle with the winter virus. <laughs> um, so the USDA, as many of you know, <clears throat> has a charge of providing an economic opportunity um, through innovative agricultural production and focusing most recently because of the um, Secretary's interest in rural America. In addition, it's charged with promoting the production of what we consider nourishing food and um, preserving natural resources. On the next slide, please you'll see um, the usual complex government organizational chart. And as many of you know, Secretary Purdue is part of the President's um, cabinet. The bottom two rows of um, undersecretaries and their respective agencies um, represent the bulk of the work that gets done with the USDA, <clears throat> with these seven undersecretaries overseeing the agencies that you see bulleted below. On the far left, on the next slide, please, you'll see that I will speak very, say just a few words about the Food Safety and Inspection Service, which falls under the Undersecretary for Food Safety. And this is the arm of the USDA that's responsible for meat, poultry, and egg products inspection for safety. The rest of the government is responsible for the other food products that are in the uh, food supply. So over the next 10 minutes, I'll now focus on those um, agencies that are related primarily to food and nutrition. And the first, if I could have the next slide, please, is that for the undersecretary, oops, <laughs> for um, food and nutrition and consumer services. And the food and nutrition service actually works in partnership with organizations across the country to provide food for children and low-income people with a focus on food security and the reduction of hunger. They oversee the food programs such as the Food Distribution, Child Nutrition, SNAP, and WIC. Recently, there was a change in the USDA such that the next slide, please. The Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion, or CNPP, which has been an independent arm, has now moved under or together with the Food and Nutrition Service. And some of you know that the CNPP is responsible for developing and promoting dietary guidance that links research to the nutritional needs of the U.S. population. Um, on the next bullet, please. Um, they're responsible for getting the information about um, science supporting the dietary guidelines through the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, which is overseen by both the USDA and the Health and Human Services. Um, the Committee for 2020 Dietary Guidelines, I do not believe, have been announced um, yet. So if we now go back to the organizational chart, on the far right, which is the next circle, we have the Research, Education, and Economics Division. And if I could have the next slide, please, which focuses a bit more on that and that there are five agencies shown under the 
at the bottom that report to the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics. And I will briefly cover the three middle ones. Next slide, please. Which is the National Agricultural Library, Economic Research Service, and National Agricultural Statistics Service, and then spend more time on the intramural and extramural um, research programs. Next slide, please. So I was a little redundant here, but now is one of four national libraries housing one of the world's um, largest collections devoted to agriculture and related sciences. And they also host our USDA food composition databases. The ERS, or Economic Research Service, is the statistical agency um, that's responsible for ensuring that the quality, objectivity, and transparency of the statistical information that's provided about trends and emerging issues in agriculture, food, the environment, and rural America. And the final middle agency, NAS, provides the annual surveys and reports which cover virtually every aspect of U.S. agriculture, ranging from production and supplies of food and fiber towards what prices are paid and received by farmers, um, farm labor and wages, farm finances, chemical uses, and then changes in the demographics of U.S. producers, not necessarily the U.S. population. So on the next slide, we get back to the um, REE um, division, where now I'll focus to the far right on the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, or NIFA. Next slide, please. This NIFA is the extramural arm of the research um, operations for the USDA. It was created by the Farm Bill in 2008, and its purpose is really to consolidate all federally funded agricultural research, which are then focused to solve national challenges in agriculture, food, the environment, and communities. And it's within this group that a lot of work gets done with respect to education about food and nutrition. In addition, their, ways is, their approach is to do an integrated approach to science, combining research, education, and extension. If I could have the next slide, please. The research priority areas for NIFA range from agroclimate science through to youth development. And it's usually done, the research, the extramural research is done in partnership largely with land-grant institutions with a total of about 112. In terms of NIFA areas of research that dovetail into what might impact diabetes prevention and care would be related to the education and multicultural alliances that they support, um, family and consumer sciences, food safety, human nutrition, and youth development. And I think all of these areas can bridge research to prevention in diabetes, although they're not necessarily specifically focused on diabetes per se, although a lot of the effort in the last five years has been, or five to 10 years, has been on obesity and overweight. If I could have the next slide, please. We're back to the REE. And now I'm going to discuss the intramural research arm, which falls under the Agricultural Research Service, which is where the Human Nutrition Research Centers um, sit. So on the next slide, ARS has a mission to really find solutions for agricultural problems that are um, affecting Americans from field to table, largely trying to support farmers and the production of healthy agricultural products for consumption. There are more than 90 research locations, including those that are overseas. And part of the mission is to ensure high quality and safe food, as well as participate in the assessments of the nutritional needs of Americans. And this is done through What We Eat in America and Haynes and the USDA Food Data Central, which is what we've renamed our USDA Food Composition Databases. So now on the next slide, I'm going to focus a little on the Beltsville Human Nutrition Research Center, which is one of six human nutrition research centers within the ARS. BHNRC is the oldest of the six, and we're actually located on 7,000 7, acres of farmland in Beltsville, Maryland, 
and I'd welcome any of you to come out and visit at some point so you can see the bucolic splendor um, within the network of large cities that we have surrounding us. We are one of three centers within the Beltsville location, with the other being the Agricultural Research Center and the National Arboretum. On the next slide, <clears throat> we have five labs in the Beltsville Human Nutrition Research Center, but two specifically assist in trying to understand dietary intake, um, food and nutrition aspects of the, for the American population. So we are responsible for monitoring America's nutritional health. Next click, please. And this is done by the lab um, called the Food Surveys Research Group, which does conduct dietary surveys of the U.S. population, provides this result to the public, and these data are often used for food and nutrition programs and policy decisions. This, next slide, please. Dietary survey is really part of the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES, that many of you have heard of. And the USDA is responsible for the aspect of what we eat in America, which is the dietary intake collection and data release. And in addition to all of the health outcomes that you note below, the information that's provided from this um, what we eat in America gives us information about the dietary intake of the populations that are surveyed. The other big responsibility that we do have at the USDA DHNRC is monitoring food composition. And if we look at the next slide, please. This was actually a responsibility that the USDA ARS has had for over 100 years. Um, starting with Wilbur Atwater, who was a chemist, and he was the first um, person to do sort of nutrition research and metabolism at the USDA. And what's very interesting is that he um, did some of the very early calorimeter studies for energy expenditure, and in the late 1800s, he actually concluded, quotes, that Americans consume too much fat and sweets and did not exercise enough. So for over 100 years, I think we've all been saying the same thing, but still are challenged from the standpoint of promoting wellness and providing health care that we haven't quite found the solutions. However, Atwater's original food composition um, handbook um, is now evolving into a much more um, online hopefully integrated system, which we will release in April of 2019. And this was delayed because of the shutdown that we had. So on the next slide, you'll see that our new food um, composition data system will be named Food Data Central. And it'll be a, um, an integrated system that'll allow you to access a number of the data sets that presently exist in disparate parts of the USDA, as well as um, on other websites. And this is to bring together under one-stop shopping information that you can obtain about nutrients and other components that's found in a wide variety of foods and products, and hopefully promote um, easier research that'll help um, improve recommendations um, for prevention of disease and for management of disease. Um, FNDDS, which is the second one down, is the What We Eat in America database. And we also have the USDA Global Branded Food Products database, which now has over 200,000 um, foods um, it listed in it, and it's really brought together as a public-private partnership between um, food manufacturers as well as government and um, ILSI North America, or the International Life Sciences Institute North America. Now, the data that's in the USDA Global Branded Food Products Database are really obtained from label data, so they do um, have the types of limitations that one would expect from label information, but it is a source of um, educational materials that are used by our consumers significantly as they try to design what they consider a healthy diet. Can you, can you repeat? 
statement you made about the International Life Sciences Institute? I, I didn't understand. The um, USDA Global Branded Foods Product Database is a public-private partnership between the food manufacturers, um, ILSI North America, who also represents, it's a nonprofit organization, but often represents um, food manufacturers, and the USDA. And this was a um, partnership that was developed and announced um, by Secretary Vilsack in 2016 and had been initiated prior to my arrival at the USDA, um, the HNRC, three years ago. And, and the purpose of the, of the partnership is to, is to do what? Is to create a database of what the food products are? What the food, correct. Including their, their nutritional content, et cetera? Well, the nutritional content that's presented on the label. Got it. Okay. And so there are limitations. So I'll, I'll just say that part of the limitations of the USDA food composition data system is that um, the number of products that are reformulated um, on a daily basis are almost impossible for the USDA to keep up with in terms of doing the chemical analysis. And so our plan with this modernization of this data system is to have available access to all of these data sets. And what I have at the top, which is foundation foods, will be um, largely focused on food ingredients and or commodities that are part of mixed foods and diets. And that will all have a, you know, um, single chemical, chemical analyses for nutrients as well as links to um, the source of the food or the commodity or the product and um, the date, obviously, and hopefully eventually a agricultural information that will be obtained such that people who are purchasing lettuce grown in California will know what that um, food might have had in terms of its nutrient content. Because what we're finding in ag is that so much of the variability in nutritional profiles is a function of where the product was grown and also how it was processed or handled. And so it's wanting to give people a transparent way of knowing that the one number that they often used or felt comfortable with um, in using for epidemiological studies has wide, oftentimes has very wide confidence intervals around that one value. And so therefore, as one tries to make recommendations, since we eat food and not nutrients, it's very important for people to recognize the limitations of some of the um, numbers that one had seen in the past. That makes sense. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so on the next slide, um, we have three other um, research laboratories within the BHNRC, and they're much more basic-oriented research laboratories: diet, genomics, immunology, as it sounds, um, food composition and methods development for the analysis of the composition of various foods and agricultural products that enter the food system, and the Food Components and Health Laboratory that conducts um, the classic metabolic feeding studies that people had done in general clinical research centers of the past. But what's important, I think, for the commission to know is that we also have a human studies facility where we can handle um, 60 to 80 volunteers a day um, and feeding them um, the prescribed diet that we would like to test, and we can do then physiologic testing, and we have three-room calorimeters, um, equipment for body composition, and other physiological measures. So it's the perfect place, I think, to be able to collaborate with other investigators to, you know, try to get some definitive information of really what does constitute a healthy plate and um, not make people afraid of food, but really to begin to embrace the different components of a varied plate and diet such that we can promote health. So on the next slide, I'll summarize briefly that the USDA 
um, not directly involved in clinical care and management, but really is trying to help understand the U.S. food supply, assist in developing some food policies, and um, collaborate, at least for the research arms, to expand our understanding of food availability and access, food choice and consumer behavior, such that we can assure wellness of the population without people getting confused about what is good or not good to have in one's plate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sukagawa. That was an interesting presentation about USDA's work, and I'm sure that will be helpful to our commission. We have um, about five minutes for questions before we take a break, so let me open it up to the commission for questions. Hi, this is uh, Sherry Ball, and that was a great presentation. I had a question. You know, often I'm seeing uh, a lot of uh, low-income families, and especially with those with diabetes, trying to address issues around food insecurity. And in our region, and I know across the state, there's been a lot of interest in linking patients with uh, food insecurity to community resources. Um, so some of the things in our region and across the state that are being looked at is sort of this idea of having sort of a food as medicine clinics within your own healthcare system where you're providing education and um, uh, trying to have beyond just providing food but healthier food options within sort of a food pantry setting. And then we've also done produce prescription programs um, that help support our local farmers as well. Um, where we're uh, working with sort of incentive programs to try and promote use of farmers markets in our area uh, around fruit and vegetable consumption, uh, and those those dollars then go to the farmers market and the farmer local farmers. So can you talk a little bit about? Um, so sorry about all that background, but the question is really, um, given that sort of framework. Um, you know, I, I think the USDA is involved in a lot of those efforts, and I didn't know if you had. Uh, it, maybe that's not true, but if it is, could you talk a little bit about some of those efforts um, around, you know, food insecurity and then also pr um, ways of stimulating the local farmers' markets and local agriculture? So I, I didn't know if that was true, and if it is, what, what sort of programs are you advocating? So that you've summarized it very well, and it's a very holistic view of what we should be doing in the USDA. Um, but as many of you know, the um, government agencies are relatively siloed or have been relatively siloed through the years. So most of those efforts are now being done by those other agencies that I had mentioned. That was at the bottom of that um, complex slide. And unfortunately, efforts to try to unify and harmonize all of our efforts um, are really uh, just beginning. But the Food and Nutrition Service, as well as the uh, NIFA programs that exist, do support a lot of the programs that you're describing. And, you know, where SNAP sits and under Food and Nutrition Services, that's where a lot of that information and those programs are being held. Now, the unfortunate or the challenges, not unfortunate, but the challenge we face is that um, the, a lot of their reports are, and in terms of efficacy, um, aren't really subject to um, um, sort of a, a lot of accountability because we don't really know where the reports sit. So the programs and money goes there to provide consumer services but whether or not some of these services are indeed effective, and this is me speaking personally, not as the USDA, um, mm -hmm. that we really don't have good data on how, what, what are efficacious programs and who are they really reaching? Because there's a lot of effort that's spent developing these things, but not necessarily, I think, reaching um, the audience that they were intended to reach. I don't know if that helps you. But. Yeah, no, that, that helps. So you, so USDA, the Food and Nutrition Services is within the USDA, or that you're saying that's a separate agency? Well, no, it's an agency within their, they have their own undersecretary. I see. So 
So that's the Undersecretary for Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services. And you would think that with the efforts um, that uh, Secretary Purdue is trying to achieve of having one USDA, that we will all be harmonized at some point with respect to our efforts and not duplicate and have cross-messaging with respect to um, what the researchers are finding out or what, you know, food safety is finding out versus what's going out in terms of um, consumer education and support. Gotcha. Thank you. Claudette, Claudette, can I jump in as Dean Schellinger? Yes, you can, Dean. We have just about a minute left. Go for it. Hey, thank you. Yeah, uh, Naomi, a fabulous talk. I, I just would like to, if I can, extend an informal invitation since I'm a panelist and not an organizer um, to have you come back and we can speak at length about um, the Farm Bill and SNAP Ed, um, which you know many believe, uh, at least in its origin and um, uh, current state. Um, may be contributing to the diabetes epidemic on the one hand, but on the other hand could really be a very, very important lever to reverse the epidemic. Um, and there have been some recent wonderful summary articles by Darius Mozafarian and JAMA. I've just sent it to Clydette. Um, she could decide if she wants to send out to the group around um, how the farm bill interacts with diabetes epidemic and what that means for policy. Um, and so I just I just would wonder if this is something that you might be able to, to do in a future call or meeting. I'd be happy to, and, and also call in, you know, people from the other agencies besides mine, which is ARS, um, because yeah. <clears throat> I do think that one of the challenges is that USDA faces is oftentimes, especially with the Farm Bill, it, it sort of ends with the production and then what happens to what they produce is not necessarily aligned well with producing things that are beneficial to health. I should. And then my, my second quick question was maybe something you can answer quickly, which is has – so my experience has been it's very difficult, very, very difficult to obtain research funding for feeding studies from the NIDDK to evaluate the effects of different foods and beverages on metabolic outcomes. Mm -hmm. USDA and NIDDK ever collaborated around calls for proposals to do very important feeding studies with respect to diabetes prevention or control? Unfortunately not, um, although now with Chris Lynch in the position that Van Hubbard had, you know, we've discussed it. Um, but I think that, that um, personally, one of the better ways to do it is to use the infrastructure that we have in the Human Nutrition Research exactly, Center exactly. Yeah. to do that. Um, and you know, by collaborating with scientists that we do have within ARS, one is able to use the infrastructure and may not necessarily um, need additional external support from NIH, although obviously the ideal thing would be to, to do it as a joint effort and project. Yeah, I think the uh, the outcomes and the metabolic markers and all, all of those things are very sophisticated now. So, yes, I think the collaboration would be helpful in that regard. And we've been trying to work something out with respect to NIH, um, the Department of Defense, as well, and, and the Army, as well as the USDA to, to um, you know, increase our capacity um, to do longer-term metabolic research. Um, but we haven't quite gotten all of the um, ducks lined up yet. Well, that, that's, a, that's a fabulous opportunity. Thank you for letting, letting us know. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Ukagawa, and thank you, Dr. Schillinger. Uh, we're going to break here. Um, you have a little bit less than a 10 minutes uh, break. We'll start promptly at 3 o'clock, and we'll enter the second half of our virtual meeting here. We'll have presentations from CNS, the Office of Minority Health, HRSA, and ARC. So please take a break, stay on the line, and we'll rejoin at 3 o'clock. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome back to the second half of the National Clinical Care Commission webinar meeting. Uh, we thank all of those who have been in attendance with us since one this afternoon and we hope that perhaps others 
will join us or um, even better that everyone will stay with us till the very end. We do recognize this has been a full program and I don't want to delay getting our other presentations underway. We are going to start with Dr. Barry Marks, who is the Director uh, of the Office of Clinician Engagement at the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And he will talk about CMS's focus on diabetes. Dr. Marks. Thank you very much. Uh, for this presentation, I'd like to highlight four areas of CMS activity focusing upon diabetes. The first is the Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program, focusing upon prevention. The second is the Quality Payment Program, merit-based incentive payment system, focusing upon clinical care service delivery. The third is the Hospital Improvement Innovation Network, focusing upon hypoglycemia as an adverse drug event. And finally, the CMS Person and Family Engagement, uh, focusing upon reduction of of disparities. Next slide, please. So first, the MDPP. Next slide, please. Uh, the challenge is represented here that among Americans 65 and older, uh, approximately 25% have type 2 diabetes. The approximate annual cost of care to these beneficiaries through Medicare is $104 billion uh, per year and growing. Next slide, please. The solution is the Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program, or MDPP. This is a program through which Medicare pays uh, organizations called MDPP suppliers to furnish a group-based intervention to identified at-risk Medicare beneficiaries. This is based on a CDC-approved national diabetes prevention program curriculum. And you can see that the three broad areas of focus of the initiative are diet, physical activity, and weight loss. Next slide, please. This represents interagency coordination between CMS and the CDC, through which the CDC is the quality assurance arm of this program, uh, maintaining standards for recognition and quality, uh, including the use of a CDC-approved curriculum for service providers. CMS's role is to coordinate the registration of these uh, suppliers within Medicare, as well as to coordinate payment and access to the benefit for eligible Medicare beneficiaries. Next slide, please. Eligibility is based upon, number one, the beneficiary being eligible for Medicare. Number two, meeting certain established criteria of body mass index and blood test results, which we'll go into in more detail on the following slide. And medical history, which includes not having a previous diagnosis of diabetes or end-stage renal disease and not having previously received MDPP services. Next slide, please. This slide breaks out in more detail the uh, eligibility criteria for beneficiaries um, again, uh, the first criteria is that they be enrolled in original Medicare Part B or Medicare Advantage under Part C, that they have a body mass index of at least 25, or if self-identified as Asian, a BMI of 23. In addition to that, they need to meet one of three blood test requirements within the 12 months prior to their first uh, session received under the program hemoglobin A1C between 5.7 and 6.4, or a fasting plasma glucose between 110 and 125, or a two-hour plasma glucose of 140 to 199 following an oral glucose tolerance test. In addition, the exclusion criteria that we mentioned previously. Next slide, please. Uh, briefly, what's covered under this, uh, in the first year of these services, those are the core services, which include six months of weekly core sessions, followed by six months of monthly maintenance sessions. Beneficiaries are eligible for a second year of the program contingent upon them having met the goals for attendance and a weight loss goal of 5% or greater. 
during the first 12 months. Next slide, please. This is an example of the sort of messaging that goes out to our stakeholders in terms of how they can help to support this program. Uh, for those programs that have achieved CDC recognition as a DPP supplier, they're encouraged, number one, to establish their recognition status and determine that it is full or preliminary. Number two, if they are recognized, to then enroll through the PICO system as a Medicare supplier. For diabetes prevention stakeholders, we ask that they encourage organizations to work towards CDC recognition and help educate organizations about CMS enrollment and billing processes for those eligible suppliers. And for clinicians, the outreach is based upon familiarity with beneficiary eligibility criteria and that this is a covered benefit and then patient education on prediabetes and the benefits of participation in the MDPP. Next slide, please. In terms of referral of at-risk patients, it's really a two-step process. Number one is to screen and test at-risk Medicare beneficiaries for prediabetes, and then number two, to do focused education of those patients about their access to the program and then refer them to uh, nearby suppliers of the service. Next slide, please. And this is just a brief list of some of the resources that are available. Next slide, please. The second area of activity that I wanted to focus on is the quality payment program. Uh, this was required under the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act of 2015 and really captures a move from paying for volume of care to paying for value of care. It has two basic components. The first is MIPS. And the second component is participation in what are called advanced APMs or alternative, alternative payment models. Next slide, please. The MIPS or merit-based incentive payment system performance categories, what we have here are the uh, breakout of weighting of categories in 2018 compared with 2019. You can see that there are four performance categories. These are quality, cost improvement activities and promoting interoperability. And you can see that some of the weightings have changed between 2018 and 2019 performance years. Next slide, please. We're going to move through the next set of slides relatively quickly. Uh, the purpose of these is to just highlight some of the quality measures around diabetes care that are built into the system uh, and incentivized. And so uh, the first is diabetes, uh, diabetic foot and ankle care and assessment for peripheral neuropathy. Next slide, please. Uh, diabetic foot and ankle care, also prevention and evaluation of footwear. Next slide, please. The uh, diabetes eye examination. Next slide, please. Uh, the diabetic foot examination. Next slide, please. Uh, medical attention for uh, evidence of nephropathy. Next slide, please. Diabetic retinopathy, communication with the physician, managing ongoing diabetes care from the vision health specialist. Next slide, please. And again, diabetic retinopathy, documentation of presence or absence of macular edema, and level of severity of retinopathy. Next slide, please. The next set of slides are examples of improvement activities that are designed to assist practices in improving the quality of services that they provide to patients uh, in, in clinical areas. And so the first improvement activity that we've highlighted here is engagement with the quality improvement networks, quality improvement organizations to implement self-management training programs. Next slide, please. Uh, glycemic management services, uh, which really lays out in more detail elements of a meaningful individualized plan of care for patients identified with diabetes. Next slide, please. 
uh, glycemic screening services uh, based on a determination that a Medicare beneficiary is at risk. Next slide, please. Uh, glycemic referral services, and this uh, is for at-risk outpatient uh, Medicare beneficiaries identified with prediabetes, referred to a CDC-recognized diabetes prevention program, such as what we discussed a few moments ago. Next slide, please. And the use of certified EHR to capture patient-reported outcomes, including incorporation of data sources such as blood glucose logs. Next slide, please. The next area that I'd like to focus upon are, is the work of the Hospital Improvement Innovation Networks, or HINs, around glycemic management. Next slide, please. This slide gives us some uh, sense of the scope of this work within the Partnership for Patients. There are 4,000 acute care hospitals participating within the Transforming Clinical Practices Initiative, 140,000 clinicians. Within the end-stage renal disease networks, 6,000 dialysis facilities, and so on. Next slide, please. The uh, work is focused on two breakthrough aims. The first is a 20% reduction in all-cause patient harm. The second is a 12% reduction in 30-day readmissions. Next slide, please. There are 16 hospital improvement innovation networks listed here. Next slide, please. There are 11 core areas of focus, and you'll see that the first of these is adverse drug events, including hypoglycemia. Next slide, please. 97.2% of the applicable hospitals are working to reduce harm in the area of adverse drug events. Next slide, please. Here are examples of some successful interventions that the HINs have obtained through, uh, around glycemic management. First is data collection and reporting, creating standardized adverse drug event measurement strategies based on ICD-10 and extracting the adverse drug event uh, data from the electronic health records. The second broad area is leadership engagement, focusing on the importance of glycemic management and to develop the business case of why this is important from both a financial and readmissions impact. Next slide, please. Regarding frontline staff engagement, coaching and assistance with managing patients on insulin pumps, eliminating sliding scale only protocols, in favor of basal bolus plus correction orders and the use of coaching assistance around recommendations for managing patients on insulin pumps. Using protocols that allow nurses to treat patients without the need to wait for physician orders. Working with nutrition services to align the delivery of meals with medication administration to prevent hypoglycemic episodes. And coordinating ongoing communication and handoffs during critical transitions of care to ensure that the timing of blood glucose checks, insulin administration, and food tray delivery are efficient and safe. Next slide, please. The final area that I'd like to highlight uh, for this presentation is in the area of person and family engagement. And here you can see the overall state of, uh, statement of purpose. Patients and families are partners in defining, designing, participating in, and assessing the care practices and systems that serve them to assure they are respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values. This collaborative engagement allows patient values to guide all clinical decisions and drives genuine transformation in attitudes, behavior, and practice. Next slide, please. The CMS Person and Family Engagement Strategy was published in December of 2016. The purpose is to create the foundation for expanding awareness and practice of person and family engagement by providing specific, actionable goals and objectives. The vision is of a transformed healthcare system that proactively engages persons and caregivers in the definition, design, and delivery of their care. Next slide, please. 
This slide demonstrates the alignment between CMS strategic goals and the Transforming Clinical Practices Initiative Person and Family Engagement Strategy Improvement Metrics. And you can see that within the overall heading of strengthening person and family-centered care, the components are patient and family voice, shared decision-making, e-tools, patient activation, health literacy, and medication management. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a fairly dense slide. This is, uh, captures how patient and family engagement are operationalized and for patient voice, are there policies, procedures, and actions taken to support patient and family participation in governance or operational decision-making of the practice? For shared decision-making, does the practice support shared decision-making by training and ensuring that clinical teams integrate patient-identified goals preferences, concerns, and desired outcomes into the treatment plan? Does the practice use an e-tool, such as patient portal or other e-connected technology that is accessible to both patients and clinicians and that shares information such as test results, medication lists, vitals, and other information and patient record data? Does the practice utilize a tool to assess and measure patient activation? Is a health literacy patient survey being used by the practice? And does the clinical team work with the patient and family to support their patient caregiver management of medication? Next slide, please. Uh, this slide demonstrates progress towards the goals specifically in the area of diabetes outreach and work. This effort is uh, the Everyone with Diabetes Counts, or EDC, initiative. And what you'll see here with the bar graphs is that in the three areas identified, they have in fact exceeded the, uh, the projected goals. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the Diabetes Outreach and Education National Results through October 31, 2018. And very quickly, uh, 6,280 educators trained to teach diabetes self-management education and support. Uh, DSMES classes taught in 16 languages. 2,878 uh, 2, provider practices receiving technical assistance. 251 new sustainable diabetes education programs open through QIO technical assistance. And 63,300 35 beneficiaries who have completed DSMES training at, for a 97.8% of the contract target. And the graph at the right shows us the degree of improvement in these four areas uh, through which uh, we surveyed patients pre and post education. Next slide, please. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mark. I would like to open this up for some questions on CMS presentation. This is Ann Bullock with the Indian Health Service. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, a couple of questions on, uh, first of all, the MDPP. Um, I know that there are, have been some concerns in um, Indian health communities um, regarding some of the requirements, um, among them the, um, uh, in order to go into the second year of, of uh, reimbursed uh, sessions, that uh, participants must achieve a 5% and maintain a 5% weight loss as well as have an attendance goal. This is difficult uh, for a lot of folks in rural areas, um, food insecure, um, all those kinds of situations that so often our, our patients find themselves in. In addition, that uh, the MDPP limits the number of uh, attempts um, through, the, th through that program in order to, uh, that will be reimbursed. Um, again, concerns have been expressed there. So if you wouldn't mind addressing those, and I have a couple other questions on the other sections of your presentation. Uh, thank you very much for this question. So I think as far as the... Um the requirement to achieve and maintain a 5% rate reduction to be eligible for the 
second year of the program. Uh, as I understand it, this was something that was built in following the original success of the model, and it's to assure that the uh, resources are being as well and effectively utilized uh, as possible. And what was the other question? So it was also an attendance uh, requirement and, and also that the MDPP limits the number of um, times that a participant can, can go through the program and have it be reimbursed. I believe it's twice. Is that right? Um, I'm not positive about that. I believe that um, they get one, uh, one uh, course through the program. Um, again, my best understanding is that the basis for that is to assure that the resources are being, uh, are being appropriately utilized. Um, and I think that's the basis for the attendance requirement. Sure. And understandable, but again, this makes it very difficult. Um, and it has, all of these things have contributed to underutilization of this um, in um, American and Alaska Native communities, at least. So wanted to raise those um, separately. Um, you mentioned about hospital readmissions with the recent JAMA article on perhaps some unintended harms coming from um, the 30-day hospital readmission uh, measure, um, at least I think it was on heart failure. Um, some thoughts on that in re uh, regards to diabetes patients? Um, so I'm not familiar with that article as it would relate to readmissions for hypoglycemia. Is that what you're speaking to? Well, just um, the unintended consequences of, of uh, I'll say, well-intentioned rules um, around, in this case, hospital readmission, you know, that um, hospitals get uh, dinged if they have uh, readmission within 30 days for a similar diagnosis. So um, just um, thinking, obviously, many patients with diabetes have cardiovascular conditions, so this, this does affect them directly uh, with the CVD ones, but also just in general, um, many of our older patients who had diabetes for many years, are, of course, are very frail. Um, and readmissions are, are are more common than 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 these rules might might allow for. So just some thoughts on that. Yeah. So I think that that's uh, a little bit beyond the scope, at least of this presentation. But I would be happy to take that back to our uh, quality improvement innovation group to get more clarity for you. Great. And and sorry, one last question on the other section um, in terms of uh, quality reimbursement. Now. Um, it's a difficult line to walk between recognizing that there are many communities in which there are patients at higher risk for, for many difficulties um, in achieving uh, not only glycemic targets, but, but many other kinds of, of clinical targets um, that balance between understanding that and also, of course, um, not allowing for an inferior quality of care to take place in those communities for reimbursement. Um, perhaps some thoughts you might have on, on how CMS is trying to, to walk that line uh, very carefully. Well, I think that's a great question, and I think the answer is that particularly for the quality measures, what we're focusing upon uh, is, is service delivery and particularly building it around individualized plans of care. I think what we're trying to, or what the agency is really trying to emphasize is the importance of that direct collaboration between the clinician, the patient, and caregivers to understand the patient's experience of care and what their goals are. Uh, for glycemic control in addition to what the clinician is hoping to help them to achieve. Right, and, and but thinking more particularly about how um, practices in, in low-income areas, disadvantaged communities, um, may have um, a harder time meeting some of the quality measures for uh, which payment is increasingly uh, dependent, um, and just making sure that um, that that understanding is goes into those and that again unintended harm will not happen through well-intentioned um, uh, quality measures thanks I think I think that that's a great point great thank you thank you dr. Bullock for the good questions advocating for um, Indian Health Service and to dr. Mark for his presentation about this work let's go ahead and move on now um, maybe somewhat germane to some of the questions we've just heard uh, we're going to now hear from the Office of Minority Health from Captain David Wong, Medical Officer in the Office of Minority Health, Assistant Secretary for Health. And Dr. Wong is going to talk with us, present to us the Office of Minority Health Activities supporting the reduction of diabetes-related disparities. Dr. Wong. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm a pediatrician and medical officer with the HHS Office of Minority Health. And next slide. 
Um, our office may be less familiar to the commission members uh, than some of the other federal agencies. We we're relatively young. We were established in the mid-1980s as a direct deliverable from a landmark HHS report on health disparities, which is also nicknamed the Heckler Report. And this was commissioned by Secretary Margaret Heckler, who was the secretary during the Reagan administration. And this is the first report that really documented from a federal perspective uh, the wide variety of health disparities across many health conditions. And so our mission is directly a result of that, where you can see our role is really to improve the health of racial and ethnic minority populations through the development of health policies and to help eliminate health disparities. And so our lens is really looking at populations as a whole versus a disease-specific condition, so to speak, and how can we reduce uh, health disparities overall. And compared to other federal agencies, we're a relatively small office with about only 30 FTEs. Next slide. Also, as a direct result of the HECLA report, there are also seven other HHS agencies that have offices of minority health, and we work very closely with them and try to coordinate our activities. Next slide. So within this broad portfolio of where we can potentially work, including chronic diseases, infectious diseases, environmental health, et cetera, we really have to prioritize given our small staff. And so typically what happens is we end up uh, prioritizing based on what some of the current HHS strategic goals and initiatives. So for example, right now, opioid epidemic is very um, hot on our topics, as well as sickle cell disease, which is important for the Assistant Secretary of Health. Uh, we also try to address broad underlying factors that can uh, affect multiple conditions, such as social determinants of health, um, cultural competency, language access. And we also, because of our size of our office, it's very important for us to leverage partnerships, both within the federal agencies and also with um, privates and, and academia. And through these partnerships, we try to illuminate and highlight health disparities and then identify solutions that can then be scaled and, and repeated and, and copied by others. Next slide. So uh, summarizing again, like kind of our different arms of how we work, um, we have grants and contracts that our office uses, and that makes up about 75% of our budget. And this is where we try to identify uh, new partners or novel approaches that if effective, we can then uh, try to share best practices with other organizations and also um, work with HHS agencies to trans transition those programs from our office to theirs. Uh, for data and policies, um, we don't do so much primary data collection, but sometimes we will do um, secondary data analyses or, or do uh, oversampling of certain minority populations for national surveys. And then we curate a lot of this information that many of the agencies on the, on the commission collect and try to describe through data briefs or through policy uh, documents uh, what these health disparities are and to raise awareness for them and to hopefully uh, inform policies and to develop interventions. And then finally, we also can have a convening function where we can work with different agencies uh, across HHS or the federal government to come together to discuss health disparities and how we can all work together to address them. Next slide. So specific with diabetes, next slide. Um, this slide is from CDC, um, the National Diabetes Statistics Report, just showing, again, how diabetes does have uh, large disparities across minority populations, which is already discussed at length in our first com commission meeting. Uh, but I just want to remind you, here you can see a large disparities, uh, particularly with uh, AIAN, Black and Hispanic populations. Next slide. So uh, some of the ways that we're doing working with diabetes is with uh, grants and contracts. And I'll just to give you a flavor of some of the um, activities that we're funding, I'm going to talk about um, a few grants and contracts and then a couple areas of where we highlight uh, data and policies for diabetes. Next slide. So with Asian Americans, um, um, research has shown that they're at risk for type 2 diabetes at lower BMIs compared to the general population, and that there's a large proportion of Asian Americans with diabetes who are actually unaware of their status. Next slide. So with this figure, um, 
if you can look at the uh, 25 BMI on the x-axis, that is what the recommended cutoff for screening for diabetes is currently by the ADA for the general population. Now, with the Asian population, as this figure shows, um, at 23, you still have probably another 15 to 20% of both men and women who have diabetes, but if they were just screened at 25, they would not be met for that screening criteria. Next slide. So our office worked with a group called the National Council of Asian Pacific Islander Physicians, NKPIP, and we actually funded to help create this organization many years ago. And NKPIPs, one of their major efforts is what's called Screen at 23. And through this effort, they were able to work with uh, the American Diabetes Association to get a policy statement recommending that Asians be screened at a BMI of 23. Now, in addition to that um, resolution, they're also um, working with states and local jurisdictions uh, such as San Francisco, Hawaii, California, to make sure that there is local le legislation supporting Screen at 23 as well. And the goal for NKPIP is to continue to work with communities that have large Asian populations to make the local governments aware of Screen at 23. And then they also are trying to develop ways to see evaluation in terms of our providers once they're aware of it, are they actually being screened? Are our patients actually being screened at that at that BMI? Next slide. Moving on to some other programs, we have a, a grant initiative that's called the SPI, State Partnership Initiative. And this is a, a grant program specifically for state departments of health and the offices of minority health that are within those state health departments or tribal health agencies. And it's a competitive process where we use the Healthy People 2020 Leading Health Indicators as a guide for thing, areas of uh, topics that are of interest to our office and priority uh, topics, where each state, you can see this uh, kind of long list of potential topics, they would submit an application that would address at least one of these topics, and then they would be eligible for the competition. And nutrition, physical activity, and obesity, which is obviously diabetes related, is one of those leading health indicators. Next slide. So a couple of the states that were awarded uh, that involved diabetes was, for an example, at Texas, uh, they were targeting African Americans and Hispanics in the Beaumont, Port Arthur, and Laredo areas. And they uh, implemented some new health fairs and diabetes self-management classes and exercise programs for these different populations. And this is, these are grants that are awarded over a five-year period. Uh, next slide. And then in Nebraska, working with American Indians, um, they uh, utilize the community health representatives, kind of the Native American lay population that gets some health training uh, to develop individualized care plans for diabetic patients and also created uh, a couple tribal diabetes task forces on both the Omaha and Winnebago tribes. Next slide. We also do a lot of collaboration with other federal agencies. So we have a new grant opportunity this year called Youth Engagement in Sports, or YES. And this is uh, being uh, done through the President's Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition, as well as ODPHP and the Office of Adolescent Health. And the goal of this grant program is uh, for communities to improve the physical activity and nutrition for sixth to eighth graders, particularly in minority communities, where there are no or few youth sport programs. There's also a nutrition component with this, where we're also trying to enhance the nutrition of these uh, individuals as well. Next slide. Going on to the data pieces. Um, so on our website, we have uh, what's called OMH Minority Population Profiles. And in the bottom right of this um, picture, with the pink arrow, is where you would find these profiles for each of the major uh, minority groups. Next slide. So just as an example, if you were to uh, click on uh, black and African Americans, you would get this slide on the left, this picture on the left, where you get a, a map showing the states, top 10 states for population for this minority population. And then many of the very common conditions, uh, like asthma, cancer, diabetes, 
uh, et cetera, for each of these populations. And you can click either any of these conditions and see what are the statistics for that condition in this minority population. And so on the right is the uh, summary the, using CDC data of diabetes and African-Americans. And you could see this kind of information for all the other minority populations as well. Next slide. We also have what's called a disparities widget where we are able to work, look at Healthy People 2020 data and specifically stratify it by disparity types, not just race and ethnicity, but also age, disability, geographic location, income, education. And uh, researchers or folks who want to get a quick snapshot of how minority populations are doing for the leading health indicators would be able to use this widget very easily. Next slide. So uh, just in summary, um, our office, um, you know, we are focused on minority populations. Uh, diabetes is certainly one uh, disease that uh, disproportionately affects them. Uh, currently, we're probably not doing uh, as much as we could be with diabetes. We certainly see this as an opportunity with the commission to enhance our work in diabetes and continue working with our partners and establishing new partnerships to see what we can do to reduce some of these health disparities. And we also want to just highlight that, um, you know, our, our role as an advocate for uh, illuminating these health disparities and increasing awareness is something that we'll always continue to do, and, and we'll, we'll work with the commission to do that as well. So I think that's the end of my presentation. I'm, I'm available. I have a, uh, time for any questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Yes, we have about uh, a little under 10 minutes for questions. Um, I'll open it up for that. If someone is speaking, be sure you are not on mute. Hi, this is Naomi um, Fukugawa. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. And um, one question is, how much interaction do you have with the other sort of federal agencies? For example, you know, USDA. That's a great question. Uh, so we we had a um, a group that was called the FIHET, uh, F I H E T, the Federal Interagency Health Equity Team, and this was the group where we reached out across the different departments, including USDA and DOD and many of the other non HHS federal members that are on this commission. Now that contract, my understanding, is being reworked, so I'm not sure, you know, the frequency or the or what uh, the FIHET will look like moving forward, but that was. A wonderful arm when I for the last seven months since I've been at the Office of Minority Health it was a great opportunity for me to meet with other agency representatives and to discuss or brainstorm potential new projects and so that was our main forum for working with uh, other departments and are you a grant supporting agency I'm sorry do you issue um, grants, extramural grants? Uh, yes. Yeah. So we, 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 we do do grants. Uh, so the grants are usually targeted for specific organizations. So I mentioned earlier some of the, the state oh, grants see. that were for state health departments, and those are uh -huh. the only eligible groups for that grant. We also have some grants that are for um, organizations, advocacy organizations that work with minority health populations say, like National Hispanic Medical Association or things like that. So um, it just depends on each grant program who the eligibility is. Uh, but mm -hmm. it just, you know, if you had a specific question for me, you know, we'd be have, I, you could let me know offline and I could discuss that further. Sure. Thank you. This is Bill Herman. Um, it's interesting that seven HHS agencies also have minority health-focused offices. Um, did that happen organically? Was that legislated? And why do some agencies not have minority health-focused offices? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I know the full answer. I started to look into that myself. 
uh, my understanding and talking to other folks is that many of them were created also as a direct result of the Heckler report. And so um, that re- that report really has been quite influential over the decades. And um, some of the HHA agencies that don't have, um, you know, Office of Minority Health, like, for example, Indian Health Service, you know, that's what they do all the time. So they don't necessarily need to have their own office. So I think most of the HHA agencies that have sizable footprint in the minority space I think are represented within those seven. And we are trying to do more of an effort to coordinate with them. So I mentioned that we work with them, but in the past, many many of the work has been kind of one-off project to project. Now with our new director, Captain Felicia Collins, who you saw on the first slide, um, she's uh, setting up meetings with all seven of the agencies over the next month or two. And we'll have kind of an an ongoing dialogue and sharing information about how we can purposefully work together. Right now, we'll also say because of the opioid epidemic that uh, all seven of those agencies, we're trying to discuss how we can all work together for opioids because that is such a specific charge from the secretary. But um, I believe that really the, the, the push for many of these offices was from that Heckler report. Thank you. And this is very interesting. If the if the opportunity presents itself in the future, learn more about your federal interagency work with uh, DOD, and if that up if that gets revisited again, uh, if that information come across, it, I'd appreciate. It. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, I, I I hope that it'll it'll exist in in some other format or a different name because it really was quite effective. And uh, I'll make sure to reach out to you, uh, Dr. Shell. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Dr. Wong and the Office of Minority Health? All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, turn to our presentation from the Health Resources and Services Administration. This is a co-presenter uh, with Dr. Commander Tracy Branch, Senior Advisor for the Strategic Partnerships Division in the Office of Quality Improvement, and also Dr. Aaron Lapata, a member of the commission who he is the Chief Medical Officer for the Maternal and Child Health Bureau in the Office of the Associate Administrator, also at HRSA. And they're gonna talk about their agency's work on the Diabetes Quality Improvement Initiative. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is Aaron Lapata. Uh, um, again, I'm a, um, I'm, a, I'm a pediatrician in addition to being the Chief Medical Officer of Maternal Child Health Bureau. And I'll start off by giving a, a little overview of HRSA and then hand it over to my colleague, uh, Commander Tracy Branch. Uh, so uh, HRSA tends to be among the, the lesser known of the HHS agencies, at least lesser known to the general public. So we thought it would be a, a good idea to quickly provide an overview of HRSA's mission and, and the role that HRSA um, can play or should play among the federal agencies in improving the care and health outcomes of people affected by diseases related to complex metabolic and uh, autoimmune diseases that result from influence-related issues, which is our charge on the committee. Uh, so HRSA contains six bureaus and 10 offices and supports more than 90 programs that collectively provide services to more than 100 million people in, in the 50 United States, the District of Columbia, and the U.S. Territory. Uh, HRSA is a principal federal agency charged with increasing access to effective and efficient basic health care for individuals and families who are medically underserved due to barriers they face in obtaining appropriate and quality care, uh, including barriers that are economic, geographic, linguistic, and or cultural. Through grants and cooperative agreements, HRSA funds more than 3,000 awardees, including community and faith-based organizations, colleges and universities, hospitals, state, local, and tribal governments, and private, ent- and private entities. Every year, HRSA programs serve tens of millions of people, including 61 million pregnant women, children, and adolescents who benefit from HRSA's maternal and child health programs, 551,000 people living with HIV AIDS in the United States receive services through the 900-plus HRSA-funded Ryan White Clinics, More than 12,000 clinicians provide services to 12 million underserved populations thanks to the National Health Service Corps program. And as uh, Tracy or Commander Branch will discuss in just a moment, 
Over 27 million people rely on a HRSA-supported health center for their care. So as you can see, because of its reach, HRSA is in a unique position to conduct outreach and communicate critical and up-to-date health and healthcare information and uh, uh, um, provide educational material such as new information and clinical research related to diabetes to healthcare providers and, 10 million, and tens of millions of people across the country each year. Uh, and with that, let me transfer it over to um, Commander Branch. Thanks, Aaron. Hi, everyone. I want to talk a little bit now about the health center side of HRSA, which is um, what you're looking at with the I'm not receiving any audio. Same here. I can hear you guys. Yeah, but not the speaker. Hi. Uh, it so, so it sounds like um, uh, Tracy got uh, uh, disconnected. Uh, so I'm going to uh, continue continue this uh, for her presentation until she can get back on. Thank you. Yeah, I was just alerting uh, Jennifer Gellison. Thank you. Sure thing. So uh, Tracy was going, to, was going to talk about the national, uh, the uh, quality, um, the I'm sorry, the diabetes quality quality improvement initiative, which is uh, run by the uh, uh, Bureau of Primary Health Care. It's one of the six bureaus within HRSA, uh, within their health center program, um, and uh, and I think she was initially going to talk about just the general impact of the health center program, which I had mentioned earlier in my, in my part of the presentation, uh, serves more than 27 million people uh, in the country. It's one in 12 people across the United States, uh, including one in three people who lives in poverty, one in five people who lives in a rural or frontier community, and one in nine of the patients uh, um, are children. Uh, and there are 3.5 million health center patients living in public housing, and 14 uh, uh, I'm sorry, 1.4 million are, are homeless, and uh, almost 1 million are, are, are agricultural workers. So this gives you a, a sense of the scope and reach of the uh, health center program and, and the critical role they play in uh, providing health care to underserved populations. So the fact that there's so many uh, health care clinics uh, around the country that provides an opportunity to uh, advance our understanding of uh, uh, how to improve the quality of care uh, for uh, diabetes. Um, so, Hi, Aaron? Just up. Yes. It's Tracy. I'm back on. Sorry about that. Oh. I don't know what happened. No worries. I was just on your on slide number five for you. So, uh, opportunity to advance diabetes. I didn't get very far. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Not sure what happened. It hurt static and then nothing. Um, can, if you can advance, perfect. That's the slide. So, um, what this slide is representing is that within our health center program, diabetes is a major health problem. In 2017, we found that 2.4 million health center patients had a diagnosis of diabetes, and they were responsible for over 8 million of our health center visits. Additionally, diabetes prevalence is much higher among our health center patients than within the general population. 15% of adult health center patients are living with diabetes as compared to the national average of about 10%. We're also finding that the percentage of our health center patients that are experiencing poor diabetes control has not significantly improved over the last several years. So in 2017, roughly 33% of our health center patients experienced uncontrolled diabetes which is reflected by the Uniform um, Data System, or our UDS measure, which is hemoglobin A1C of 9% or higher. Um, and you may hear where that sounds a little familiar to um, our Healthy People 2020 um, diabetes measure, which is where we're, we're taking this from. So currently, only 4% of our health center funded, of our HRSA funded health centers are meeting the Healthy People 2020 Diabetes Objective for patients with uncontrolled diabetes, which should be below 16%. So in fact, between 2015 and 2017, as you'll see reflected on that slide, um, nearly there was a nearly 5% decrease in the number of health centers that were able to meet the Healthy People 2020 goal 
which basically means 4.8% of our health center patients experienced worsening diabetes control over that three-year period of time. So between 2015, um, sorry, the um, Health Center Diabetes Quality Improvement Initiative strives to improve performance on the diabetes measures by increasing the number of patients with controlled diabetes with a goal of decreasing under, uncontrolled diabetes to below that Healthy People 2020 goal of 16.2%. Next slide. So health centers have proven to be a cost-effective health care delivery um, strategy. Management of a diabetic patient in a health center facility can reduce the cost by more than $1,600 per patient over other health care settings. It's also projected that if patients with uncontrolled diabetes could control, could, I'm sorry, reduce their hemoglobin A1C by just 1.25%, we would see an associated cost savings to the health center program of over $3 billion, and that's billion with a B, dollars over a three-year period of time. If our 2.4 million diabetic patients were seen in private offices, it would cost roughly $6.6 .6 billion to treat those individuals. In the healthcare setting, the cost is $2.3 billion to serve diabetic patients, resulting in a cost savings roughly of $3.8 billion annually. You'll see where within this slide we also look at um, some of the work that we're doing to address complications from diabetes as well. So as you'll see in that um, image, you know, looking at our screening for um, diabetic retinopathy, looking at um, how we are addressing foot screenings, um, looking at renal disease and end-stage renal disease, and then looking at reducing incidence of stroke and um, cardiac arrest. Next slide. To improve the ability to effectively address patients with worsening diabetes, in 27, the Bureau of Primary Health Care included a requirement that diabetes become a priority for all of our funded programs that included health centers as well as those HRSA-funded organizations that provide technical assistance to health centers and health center staff. To support this new initiative, a Diabetes Quality Improvement Workgroup was formed and was charged with development of a strategy, goals, and activities to support this, this goal. The initiative was rolled out to Bureau of Primary Health Care funded programs in, the, in June of 2017. Initially limited to, a office, to um, an office that's within the Bureau of Primary Health Care, the initiative has now grown and includes other bureaus and offices within HRSA. Additionally, HRSA has forged collaborations with the American Diabetes Association, YMCA USA, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and um, all with the goal to offer health center staff subject matter expertise and access to programs and resources that they're currently lacking. The Diabetes Initiative has the goal of reducing the incidence of new cases of diabetes in health center patients and for those patients living with diabetes, as well as improving diabetes control as reflected by the hemoglobin A1C goal of below 9%. Additionally, the initiative aims to reduce racial and ethnic diabetes disparities. Pacific, Pacific Islander and health center patients, um, Pacific Islander health center patients, sorry about that, experience a 43% um, incidence of diabetes compared to 23% of Asians. This initiative aims to reduce that gap in um, diabetes health outcomes. Childhood obesity prevention, although a separate initiative of HRSA, is included under our Diabetes Quality Improvement Initiative. And it's included there simply because of the correlation between obesity and diabetes. 
The Childhood Obesity Prevention Initiative aims to increase the percentage of health centers that are conducting weight screening and nutritional and physical activity counseling of children and adolescents and their families. Additionally, health centers participating in a pilot program will utilize multidisciplinary care teams to screen for food insecurity, um, assess physical activity within the patient population, and then connect families requiring access to either healthy foods and or um, experiencing high rates of food insecurity to local food security programs, either administered by the local community or community-based organizations within the local community or federal um, food security programs. Next slide. Implementing a learning health system is the approach that HRSA is taking to advance diabetes quality improvement within our health center program. Establishing a, a health system a learning health system where we leverage the resources of our multiple public and private partners, which can include our health centers, our health center controlled networks, primary care associations, as well as our technical assistance and training partners, and national and professional organizations to work in coordinated fashion, utilizing principles of quality improvement and data-driven decision-making. Then we translate those principles into activities and then communicate and share those evidence-informed promising practices and lessons learned um, as part of this core function of a continuous learning health system, which we're finding has become um, very important as well as a really great tool for our health center programs. Next slide. The HRSA um, Diabetes Quality Improvement Initiative takes a two-pronged approach to diabetes prevention and management. The first prong focuses on primary prevention by requiring health centers to increase weight screenings and to conduct those nutritional and physical activity um, counseling and educational interventions with patients and their families. This intervention allows for the, the identification of patients at risk for developing diabetes at an earlier stage, ideally a stage where behavior modification can reduce the risk of individuals ever developing the disease. It's also at this stage that providers can screen for and address the social factors that impair optimal health outcomes, such as food insecurity, lack of safe places to exercise, and other um, confounders. The second prong of the initiative addresses those patients that have, have been diagnosed with diabetes. The goal there is to improve the health outcomes of diabetic patients by improving diabetes control and conducting secondary screening for diabetic complications such as renal and eye disease and, again, amputation risk. Disease control is reflected, again, by our hemoglobin A1C, which should be below 9%. And in fact, closer to 7% that the hemoglobin A1C is, the greater the ability to prevent diabetes complications. It's important to keep in mind that the actual uniform data system, or our UDS measure, um, diabetes measure, reflects an inverse relationship between diabetes control and the number reported, meaning the disease is the um, meaning the goal is to decrease the number of patients with uncontrolled diabetes. Therefore, the goal is to reach zero patients in our health center programs with uncontrolled diabetes. Next slide, please. Realizing health centers have struggled to effectively address diabetes, technical assistance resources have been made available to health center staff as a strategy for diabetes quality improvement. Health center control networks, uh, go back a slide. Yep, there you are. Um, health center controlled networks, primary care associations, and technical assistance national cooperative agreement organizations that address the unique needs of our special and vulnerable populations were all charged with delivering te um, training, technical assistance, and with the development of educational resources 
to support health center staff in addressing the clinical, administrative, and fiscal challenges of diabetes management. Many of the barriers that health centers face in diabetes care delivery are related to social determinants of health that include poor health literacy, transportation barriers, food insecurity, expenses related to medication and monitoring devices, and that list goes does go on and on with regards to our patients. The technical assistance that the health centers receive focus on improving provider performance, facilitating patient-focused interventions, and implementing processes that influence systems change. This, out, this slide outlines um, some of those areas that the technical assistance works to address. Um, and as you can see, again, it's not all in inclusive, and there, there are frequently areas that we're finding our health centers are identifying that were not necessarily a part of our core um, focus or topics that, we're, that we were initially addressing but now have begun to um, incorporate and develop training resources to um, address within our, our health center program. Next slide, please. Our health center staff have identified some specific needs to improve their quality and performance improvement activities. The ability to identify and utilize evidence-informed models um, in the form of best and promising practices, toolkits, and other um, strategies. The identification of strategies to provide peer-to-peer -peer learning the identification of um, subject matter experts or collaborative partners to support diabetes quality improvement measures um, or their efforts. Needs also include training on existing, existing billing and reimbursement of diabetes prevention and management services, as well as reimbursement for clinical management activities that include the use of technology, such as texts and emails, virtual clinical visits, group visits um, for chronic disease management. And then some of the areas that health centers have identified as being of greatest need for them include um, the ability to demonstrate multidisciplinary care team approaches to diabetes management, um, the employment of diabetes group visits, integration of technology, um, into diabetes clinical um, decision-making tools for patient management, and then providing resources that are scalable to our rural and frontier communities, as well as being applicable to our urban and inner city settings. And then also, again, with our health center program, one of the areas that's really challenging are most of our facilities are resource limited. So, um, you know, when you start looking at our mobile unit or our mobile clinics or our public housing and school-based clinics, they don't necessarily have the robust uh, multi multidisciplinary specialties on site that can provide some of the um, support, and as a result, they have to look elsewhere for some of those resources. So in addition to what you're looking at on the slide, um, health centers have also identified um, that there is a need for us to address diabetes-related risk management. HRSA, as an administrator of the Federal Tort Claim Act program, recognizes that the risk and costs associated with diabetes, in particular um, complicated obstetrical cases that include complications from gestational diabetes, which increase patients' um, risk for morbidity and mortality, as well as being a significant financial burden to the government, um, is also an area for them to begin focusing on. And many of our health centers do have a risk management um, focus within their, or staffing within their prospective facilities that are looking at this, and they're always looking for, again, some of those model practices that they can utilize. So with that, go ahead and move on to our next slide. And if we have time for questions, I'm happy to entertain any. Thank you. 
Commander Branch and Dr. Lapata. Um, yes, we have a few minutes for questions. I'll open it up. This is uh, Bill Herman. When you were discussing diabetes prevention efforts, you talked about behavioral modification and weight screenings and counseling. Have you incorporated the National Diabetes Prevention Program with CDC recognized programs through the health centers? Um, yes and no. And I say that in that each of our health centers is unique. Although HRSA funds them, they are each individual, each one is an individual facility. So it's up to them as to what their capacity is and whether or not they'll adopt specific programs. I have been collaborating um, for about a year now with CDC, and what we've been working towards is increasing the number of HRSA-funded health centers that have become um, National Diabetes Prevention Program recognized. So we do have a number of our, our health centers that are National DVP recognized. And then we have um, a number of our, for instance, our primary care associations in several of our states have been working with um, the health centers in their respective states to better understand what the criteria are for um, recognition and then working with them to to gain at least provisional um, status. So it's something that we're recognizing and we're working towards, but it's not been adopted um, by all of our facilities at this time. Thank you. Additional questions? Yes, additional questions for uh, our HRSA team? This is Anne with Indian Health Service. Uh, what is your vacancy rate like for clinicians um, in the community um, clinic system? Boy, um, I would have to look to see what the current numbers are, um, and, and that would also vary depending on what specialty you're looking at. Sure. Now, I, I just was trying to uh, understand a little bit about how, I mean, that's a big issue, of course, in our, our mm -hmm. system, and I assume somewhat in yours, um, both because of perhaps pay um, issues as well as, um, you know, all the reasons why clinicians do and don't choose different practices. So. Um, wondering how that might be affecting your ability to um, provide the kind of um, care and the goals you you set out for yourself. Thank you. Most definitely, um, workforce development and and provider retention is a huge issue for us, which is why one of our other sides of the house is our um, bureau Prim uh, bureau of health workforce, which focuses on nothing but um, recruitment and retention of providers for our health center program. Um, we do find, as we start to look through some of our data as it pertains to diabetes outcomes, we do find that a lot of our smaller health centers that traditionally have trouble with workforce um, retention, you know, of course, for obvious reasons, are going to do poorer in many of their outcomes, di um, health outcomes, diabetes being one of them. Um, whereas our facilities, a lot of our facilities where they have a larger health system that can absorb or um, better handle those situations where you may have a provider who leaves, where others can then, uh, you know, sort of take on the work of those um, individuals. We don't have that same level of capacity within, you know, a facility where you may only have two to three providers and one leaves and that provides or creates a significant um, shortfall in their capacity to to monitor a lot of their patients. So it's definitely something we're aware of, and it's something that we're actively working on. In fact, we have um, two of our national cooperative agreements are focused specifically on workforce and workforce development for that reason. Thanks. Yeah, I know it's a, a huge issue for um, clinics like yours and ours. So. Um, something we're all working on. Thank you. Any other questions for Commander Branch or Dr. Lopata? All right, well, let's go ahead and stay on track with our um, agenda. We have our last presentation from the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality, Dr. Howard Tracer. 
He serves as medical officer for the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force Program and works within the Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement. Dr. Tracer will talk uh, to us about giving us an overview of ARC, data and analytics, evidence synthesis, and implementation science activities. Dr. Tracer, thank you. Uh, thank you. So as uh, Clyde just, just told you, I want to give you um, an overview of ARC activities over the next 20 minutes or so. And uh, what I'd like to say at the beginning is ARC is focused more on health systems research um, and not really a disease-focused um, uh, uh, agency. And so as I talk about the activities that um, ARC um, is involved in, um, I will give you examples along the way of how these activities um, are or can be applied to diabetes. Um, and with that, next slide, please. So at ARC, um, our mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable, and also to work with HHS and other partners to make sure that the evidence is understood and used. Uh, next slide, please. And so what do we do at ARC and how do we make a difference? So ARC collects and generates measures and data that's used to track and improve performance and evaluate the progress of the U.S. healthcare system. ARC invests in research and evidence to understand how to make healthcare safer and improve quality. And ARC also creates materials to teach and train healthcare systems and professionals to catalyze improvements in healthcare. And next slide, please. And I've just given you an overview of the how and the why. And so this slide, I uh, just want to tell you um, the why, which is our goal which is to improve the lives of our patients. Next slide. Okay, now I'm gonna get into some of the specifics um, of data and analytic activity at ARC. And the first one is the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project, or HCUP. And so HCUP, as you can see at the top, is a federal, state, private partnership. And HCUP is a comprehensive set of publicly available all-payer healthcare data um, you can access HCUP databases. There are online tools to help um, uh, an interested person do that. Um, you can use or apply analytics to the data, um, and there's also user support available online. Um, and next slide, please. So again, um, the first bullet point is a little bit of a repetition, but again, HCUP is a three-way cooperation between the state, federal government, and industry. And um, HCUP includes the largest collection of longitudinal hospital care data in the United States, so it's a very unique data set. Um, and so HCUP collects, and therefore the data can be used to answer questions um, around several issues, issues um, including the use of hospitalization, emergency department, and um, ambulatory surgery services, um, as well as the expected payer for these services, HCUP also collects demographic data, so you can look at these services by patient age, race, race ethnicity, um, a geographic location of the patient, um, and maybe perhaps more relevant to the commission, um, HCUP also does collect data on clinical conditions and comorbidities, and it also, of course, collects these data over time, so you can look at trends in the data um, over time. And next slide, please. So uh, what I have here is one example of, use a lot of utilizing uh, HCUP data. And this um, slide shows you um, inpatient stays for diabetes in the state of Maryland over the time period from 2007 to 2018. And you can see about two-thirds to three-quarters of the way on that graph um, a dashed line representing Medicaid expansion date. Um, and of course, you can see what happens to the lower line, which is um, uninsured hospital admissions, and that falls dramatically. At the same time, you have a, a, um, a concomitant increase in Medicaid hospital um, admissions for diabetes. Um, overall, you can look at the trend in the data, 
and sort of get a sense that there hasn't been much of an increase or de decrease um, over time in diabetes hospitalizations. Um, and then you see a little bit of a discontinuity where the data switches from ICD-9 to ICD-10 um, codes. And that's a little bit of a limitation in the data. Um, next slide, please. And the next uh, big data um, and analytics uh, um, project that um, ARC uh, um, is funding is MEPS, or the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey. Um, MEPS is a nationally representative sample of the civilian non-institutionalized population of the USA focusing on medical care and costs. And MEPS consists of three components. So there's a household component, a medical provider component, component, and an insurance component. And next slide, please, I'll expand on that a little bit. So the household component is really the, I think, the most important component um, for our purposes. And that survey collects data from a nationally representative sample of about 15,000 families and individuals in selected communities across the United States. And it has uh, done that annually since 1996. So again, the trend data over time. I um, mentioned before and underlined here nationally representative. And I think what's unique about MAPS is that it is um, designed statistically to be a nationally representative sample. So where some other um, healthcare sample data might be from an individual um, healthcare plan or an individual pharmacy benefit manager, for example, those might just represent people who have private insurance. It might not be nationally representative in that way. It might represent a specific geographic area or um, be sort of weighted towards a specific geographic area, whereas MEPS really does um, intend to be nationally representative. And again, it provides national estimates of healthcare use, including again, for clinical purposes, diagnoses and medications, as well as expenditures, um, insurance coverage, and sources of payment. Then um, the MEPS uses the medical, the next component, the medical provider component, that is primarily used to supplement the um, household component data. So if you identify um, a care location, a hospital, or um, a physician, then MEPS will query that um, care provider to get um, additional information or confirm information. And uh, next slide, please. So again, here are, in the next two slides, I'll show you examples of how the MEPS data can be used. Um, and here is a graph of a number, the number of people with care for a given condition um, by that condition. And I, I've uh, displayed that for the years 2010 to 2015. You can see the blue line at the bottom is diabetes. You can see there's a slowly rising trend um, in people with care for diabetes over that five-year period. The number of people in care in 2015 is approximately 27 million. And then you can see the same data for um, hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And next slide. And then you can do the same thing for medications. And these are the top five um, prescribed medications in 2015. Uh, might be a little bit hard to see, but again, um, relevant to the um, charge of our commission, the uh, number four most commonly pres prescribed medication was metformin with approximately 15.7 million um, total number of person persons who purchased metformin in 2015. As you can see, several of the other medications may be um, relevant to diabetes as well, including lisinopril um, and simvastatin um, and atorvastatin. And next slide, please. Um, next, I want to move on to ARCS activities in evidence synthesis. Um, and I want to talk about our evidence-based practice center program. The vision of that program is that healthcare decisions are based on the best available evidence, resulting in the best possible health outcomes. And um, on a more I guess, functional level, the EPC program supports 12 um, academic um, and research organizations, which are evidence-based practice centers. Um, those centers provide um, the unbiased um, synthesis of the evidence, and the, of the evidence, and they are um, 
funded by but independent of the federal government. And the other uh, important component of the EPC program is to partner with external organizations to promote um, this evidence-based um, practice or evidence-based decisions. So ARC will support the programs to synthesize the evidence and then partner with stakeholders and organizations to sort of implement, disseminate, and promote that evidence-based practice. Next slide, please. And here's one example um, of an evidence synthesis that was um, done through the EPC program, this one relating to diabetic neuropathy. Um, the objective of the program is to assess benefits and harms of interventions for preventing diabetic peripheral neuropathy complications and also treatment of diabetic peripheral peripheral neuropathy symptoms. Um, I just want to go over the first key messages. You can read the others um, on your own, but again, relevant um, to uh, what we are all looking at. Uh, one of the findings of the evidence synthesis was that intensive glycemic control is not more effective than standard control for preventing foot ulcers, but it does prevent amputations. Um, and then I think the next finding won't surprise anyone intensive glycemic control has higher rates of hypoglycemia than standard treatment. And so now we have that um, evidence base and uh, our partners can use that to help in their decisions around diabetes care. And um, next slide, please. Uh, the next evidence synthesis program uh, that I want to talk about is the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force Program. Um, just a couple of things about the task force. The task force is an independent panel um, of non-federal experts in prevention and evidence-based medicine. So again, they are independent, and the task force itself is a non-federal um, um, group. Um, the task force makes evidence-based recommendations about clinical preventive services, including screening, counseling, and preventive medications with a focus on primary care. And it makes these recommendations based on review of the existing peer-reviewed evidence or the peer-reviewed literature. Um, next slide, please. ARC is um, tasked with providing administrative, scientific, technical, and dissemin dissemination support to the um, task force. It's uh, tasked to do so by Congress. And again, what I said before is important to stress. So ARC provides support to the task force, but again, it's important to note that the task force itself uh, is not a federal aid, uh, entity or a federal agent, part of a federal agency. It's an independent entity. Um, and I want to go to some specific examples of task force uh, products and recommendations. So next slide, please. So here is the task force recommendation on screening for diabetes, just as an example. And the task force recommends screening for abnormal blood glucose in adults age 40 to 70 who are overweight or obese. And then the second part of the recommendation, again, relevant to what several um, of my colleagues have talked about today, clinicians should offer or refer patients with abnormal blood glucose to intensive behavioral counseling interventions to promote a healthful diet and physical activity. So again, think of programs like the Diabetes Prevention Program. And one of the um, underlying pieces of evidence for the recommendation studies that specifically treat people who have impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance with these intensive lifestyle interventions to prevent the development of diabetes consistently show a benefit in reducing progression to diabetes. So we know that diabetes prevention programs work. Next slide, please. And another task force recommendation, this one um, related to um, obesity. The task force recommends that clinicians offer or refer patients with a BMI of 30 or higher to intensive multi-component behavioral interventions. So the task force found adequate evidence that behavior-based weight loss interventions in adults with obesity can lead to clinically significant improvements in weight status and in the specific subpopulation that we were just talking about, um, reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes among adults with obesity and elevated plasma glucose levels. And so, again, recommendations that are sort of relevant um, as we look at the evidence base for what works in preventing diabetes. Um, and next slide, please. Finally, um, I want to spend a couple of minutes 
talking about arts activities um, in implementation science. The first thing that I want to talk about is what's the importance or why do implementation science. Um, it may or may not be necessary for all the people in this group, but um, as you may know, evidence-based practices typically don't become part of routine clinical care on their own. Um, evidence-based evidence practices can take a long time, many years, to be incorporated into routine practice, and one study reported as long as uh, 17 years, which is really um, an opportunity to improve the quality and effectiveness of healthcare. And um, another fact is that only about half of evidence-based practices ever reach widespread clinical practice. So perhaps people are resistant to change, but for some reason, a lot of these, these evidence-based practices don't become part of clinical practice. And so by implementation science, we're, we're trying to understand how can we facilitate and promote the spread of these evidence-based practices, again, to improve the quality, safety, and value of healthcare. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, one of um, our um, activities in the implementation science field is around shared decision-making. And um, that's the SHARE approach, which I'll talk about in a minute. So SHARE decision-making is the process whereby a healthcare provider and a patient work together to make a healthcare decision that's best for the patient. And so that's bringing the clinician or the practitioner's um, expertise and, and knowledge and sort of um, explaining to the patients what the trade-offs are about certain treatment um, approaches. And the patient brings their own values and preferences knowledge of, of what their, how they see the risks and benefits of what their social situation and social supports are, um, and coming together with those um, two perspectives um, to, to get a, um, a shared approach to the uh, problem and a shared approach to goal setting and decision making. Next slide, please. So why uh, should clinicians do shared decision making? Well, it's a good clinical practice. It um, provides patient-centered care. The patients want to be involved, and uh, it improves patient satisfaction and their experience of care. It may improve ha health outcomes, which makes sense. The patient feels more engaged, and they also have a goal that they may feel is more appropriate for them and more attainable, um, and then certain um, quality improvement initiatives and certain policy initiatives actually um, would either promote or actually require shared decision making. Um, so next slide, please. The share approach is just sort of a more concrete way to think about shared decision making. So the share, S-H-A-R-E, stands for the steps on this um, slide, seeking your patient's participation, helping your patient explore the treatment options, assessing your patient's values and preferences, and then reaching a decision together with your patient, and then evaluating your patient's decision. And I'll just say it doesn't need to be a linear process, and it, uh, and it also can be an iterative process. It's kind of moving back and forth between those steps. Um, next slide. So obviously, and you've heard it from several of my, uh, my colleagues today, Shared decision-making is very important and very useful um, approach in diabetes um, around setting goals, um, A1C goals, treatment options, self-monitoring, et cetera, um, and that almost goes without saying. And I just wanted to uh, remind everybody on, on the call today, at our first meeting, um, the VA healthcare system showed a patient-oriented um, educational video on shared decision-making and that was uh, between a patient who had diabetes and complication of hypoglycemia and his healthcare team. And that video was the product of a collaboration between um, the VA and ARC, and that um, video used the SHARE approach. So I wanted to remind um, everybody of that. Um, and next slide, please. So moving on to the um, final uh, ARC activity in implementa implementation science, um, a fairly large initiative for ARC, which is Evidence Now. And Evidence Now is an ARC grant initiative and that's designed to help small and medium-sized primary care practices across the U.S. use the latest 
evidence or implement the latest evidence to improve the heart health of millions of Americans. And in some ways, it's a, a both a quality improvement um, initiative and also understanding what works in quality improvement. So it's both those goals. Um, and I think many of us coming from academic centers, large healthcare systems, um, would be very familiar with what evidence now is doing. But again, the additional focus here is to try to bring this um, impl- this um, knowledge and this implementation activity to smaller and medium-sized primary care practices. So rural practices, two, three, four person-sized practices that don't have the same resources that um, an academic center or a healthcare system might. So wanted to um, also remind people of the sort of the setting of evidence now. So next slide, please. So what are the evidence now goals? I kind of talked about them a little bit, but it's helping those small primary care practices implement evidence to improve healthcare with a focus on the ABCs, and that would be aspirin where it's appropriate, blood pressure control, cholesterol control, and smoking sensation, smoking cessation, and those are the ABCs. And at the same time, to build and disseminate a blueprint um, or sort of a, a guide, if you will, of what works to help transform primary care. Uh, next slide, please. So what types of uh, quality improvement strategies is evidence now using? Starting with the circle on the right, um, among the things that evidence now is looking at is health IT support, so perhaps reminders in the electronic health uh, system in the EHR, um, shared learning collaboratives, so providers sort of learning from each other, expert consultation, so having experts give a weekly or a monthly talk about some topic related to cardiovascular disease um, to a primary care practice, data feedback and benchmarking. And again, I think you've heard, certainly have heard several of these things this afternoon, but again, by um, seeing how um, an individual, let's say, provider is doing on their blood pressure control compared to their peers can be motivating. Um, it can also um, help that person realize that perhaps they're not doing as well as their peers and then, again, start a conversation around, well, what do, do my peers do? What are other people doing that is improving their blood pressure control of their patients or improving cholesterol control. So, again, if you don't measure it, then you can't see it and you don't necessarily know what you're doing. And then, um, finally, on-site practice facilitation um, and coaching. So those are among the strategies that Evidence Now um, is using or testing. Next slide, please. And finally, um, getting to the end, um, at the website listed at the bottom of the page are all the evidence now tools. Um, but just to sort of point out that what you'll find at that um, website, evidence now backslash tools, it's a collection of over 100 tools and resources to help practices increase their capacity to implement best practice or best evidence. And when I saw the 100 tools, I was wondering what they were because sometimes that can seem a bit overwhelming. So just to say to the group, those are very concrete and granular tools. Um, they're really intended for not for the individ- individual provider, but really for the practice facilitator, practice manager, healthcare system leader to sort of look at how can we implement these different strategies. So it is a very concrete tool set. Um, and again, that toolkit um, can be a resource to help promote evidence-based practices and QI initiatives for diabetes. I mean, I don't know if I said that at the outset, but the point about evidence now, which is focused on cardiovascular disease, is certainly directly applicable to diabetes um, as well as other chronic illnesses. Um, I think that may be the next slide, uh, the last slide, rather, next, yes. So uh, now you certainly have time for your questions, and next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tracer, for your presentation about ARC's activities. Um, as with all the presentations, we will open it up for some questions and discussion um, of this particular presentation. If you happen to be asking a question, you may be on mute. 
I'm not hearing other questions. Uh, open it up to a commission discussion that will be led by Dr. Bill Herman. Good. Thank you, Claudette. I want to thank all of the uh, speakers for wonderfully concise and uh, stimulating presentations. Um, I wonder if there are any general discussion points from the members of the commission. Well, oh, related to some discussion points, let me just uh, remind our, our public that uh, this and today complemented the in-person presentations that we had from CDC, IHS, and the VA. And um, this complete overview of the federal programs uh, in diabetes. So this will help set a foundation for the work of the commission mm -hmm. going forward. This is David Strogatz. Um, I th think it would be very helpful to See if we could get more information about the N NDPP and you know specifically the MDPP and and what data they've got about the you know the its implementation any anything we know about its evaluation uh, and perhaps to hear from that as well as from you know, obviously CDC would also be able to provide information about. NDPP, you know, apart from what's being offered for Medicare, I think it would be, you know, very helpful to have any additional information that they have about that, and as we might make recommendations for, uh, you know, expanding access to that program. And this is Barry Marks. I would certainly be more than happy to try to put something like that together uh, for the commission. Now, Thank you, my understanding is it's re it's relatively recent that it's it's been underway. As a formalized covered benefit, uh, that is correct. And do we have yeah. Ann Albright on the phone from CDC? Yes, hi. Yeah, this is Ann Albright. Uh, we certainly have had the national DPP, and just a reminder that is the official term for exactly the reason as it can be confusing to say MDPP, NDPP, don't people don't know whether you're saying an M or an M. So Medicare uses the acronym MDPP, the official uh, acronym for the national DPP is that, national DPP. And obviously the national DPP of which the Medicare DPP is a part, it falls under the umbrella of the national DPP. Uh, we were authorized by Congress in 2010 to establish the national DPP. So that's been around certainly much longer. And we have um, data, real-time data. I can tell you every day how many programs there are and how many people have been cumulatively enrolled. Um, we also have data on outcomes. It depends on how one defines completers of the program. And we provide that in publications and we'll soon be uh, providing at least uh, cumul you know, cumulative or um, aggregated data. Um, our intent is to publish a monthly update on that. But we're happy to um, bring the staff who work directly in the recognition program uh, to talk about that. We also have a number of uh, funding efforts and uh, work with state health departments, local health departments, national organizations. We collaborate with a number of our federal agencies on the phone uh, that you've all heard from today uh, on engagement and retention. That's a huge uh, feature of CDC's investments right now is to really work much more diligently and to encourage all investigators to be working on engagement and retention in the program because it's obviously critical. Coaches are a key to that engagement and retention as well. So we're happy to provide more information and in, in depth on um, how that's going, what's going on, and um, what we really need all stakeholders to be doing because if this truly is going to scale nationally as is the expectation and the intent is that it does require all stakeholders uh, playing their part. And um, I'll just sort of closing indicate we, are, of course, are all always open for debate and discussion. Sometimes, however, the debate can get less than productive. Um, there are certainly differences of opinion on the diagnostic criteria for prediabetes. There are uh, 
concerns that if people are diagnosed with this condition, it, all it's going to do is increase medication prescription for people. So I would sort of add not only knowing where the program is, the status of its outcomes and, and um, participation, but also I think it would be worthy for some future conversation on some of the I would say communication barriers or challenges um, that one faces when you're trying to roll out a nationwide program. And again, while you always want debate and discussion, it makes things better. Uh, there, there is, I think, some points where it can become uh, not only not helpful, but can also be damaging to uh, efforts and implementation. Other comments? Uh, this is John Boltree. Um, one, I was struck by how much, how many, and how much programmatic work is going on in all of the agencies. Uh, much of what I and many of my colleagues didn't know about. Um, and so uh, that makes me think of, uh, one, how can we put together some kind of uh, storyboard or some kind of um, large compendium that puts this puts all of what's going on together for uh, practitioners as well as patients to be better aware of and, and, and how I think one of the things that I'm asking is how can we better get all of these programs out on people's plates so that they're aware of them. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that's something that's thought about a lot at the CDC, so I just thought I'd throw that out there. This is Don Schell. My, my thoughts are kind of similar. My, my thoughts at the end of hearing all the presentations are, how do we arrive at a point where we're matching the greatest need with the greatest opportunity? And, you know, I'm thinking about the Office of Minority Health presentation and USDA's presentation and, you know, how do we as a, a body or a group sit down and look at how to maximize the potential for the, of the programs in existence already with the greatest potential based on the data that's available and the opportunity that are available for targeted populations, but how do we get to that spot where we match the greatest need, greatest potential, and for the greatest impact and improvement in diabetes management and prevention? So, a lot of information, a lot of good information today. Thank you. Well, I also made a note about the, uh, what Dean had mentioned that I think it was a JAMA paper on the Farm Bill and Diabetes that he had sent to Clydad. If she wouldn't mind distributing that, I think that would be of interest. Yes, I certainly will. That's my plan. Thank you. And this is Bill Herman again. So I think the next task for the commission are to review and organize what we've heard today as well as what we heard previously from CDC and IHS and the VA and NIH to try to organize uh, what we see as the existing programs and policies, try to gather more information from each of the agencies about what they're doing currently, what they think the opportunities would be to expand programs and even potentially things that they're not doing that they might do. And then I would see us trying to pull that together and look across agencies for common themes in terms of programs and policies uh, to try to come up with uh, highlight opportunities and, and future directions. Does that make sense to folks? Any comments on that? Yes, that makes a lot of sense, Bill. I'm sorry, who was that who agreed? John Boltry. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hi, this is Clyde Ed. I might also just say that given the presentations that we had last time from IHS, VA, CDC, and IH, and then the ones that we've had today, we might want to revisit some of the framing statements and um, some of the tables that the subcommittees have been developing. I would agree with that to sort of see where the, the, the policies and programs fit in with the, the grid structure that we've been developing. and. Uh, how we might uh, encourage integration among the programs or uh, target some of the gaps that we may have identified. Though it sounds like there's a tremendous amount going on through the various federal agencies. Yes, there's just 
is, and this was a lot of information to absorb uh, in one afternoon. So I would expect people to um, the PowerPoint, or perhaps if you, uh, you know, have time to listen to the audio recording that ultimately is posted, um, or if perhaps uh, some of the presentations, I think I've heard some people suggest that we uh, perhaps do a deeper dive or maybe a, a better sense more time allotted to some of the programs and presentations, uh, perhaps at a subsequent meeting. Yeah, I was, this is Sherry Boland. I was thinking about our, um, there were some like initial questions I know we had talked about trying to ask to the different agencies. And I'm, I guess I'm wondering, um, as I'm thinking about all the different programs and activities that we heard today, you know, is there a way to, to put that in, in um, not just thinking about our grid, but, um, and hopefully those questions that we were thinking about would, would map to our grid, but I think having a list of some of those things would, would, would definitely be helpful. Um, in particular, I was thinking about, and this is just one example, the shared decision-making tools that were mentioned by the Department of Defense, um, and then there was some discussion around that with ARC as well. Um, so you know, trying to get a sense of, of, you know, are there other places that are doing any of that? What are some of the, um, uh, you know, are all the tools on ARC the same as the ones that are on DOD? I just think um, that came up a lot in our subcommittee around shared decision making and just thinking about, um, you know, how do we, there's going to be some areas like that, like that would be good to nail down a little bit more detail. Um, certainly the food conversation, I think, um, would be great to hear a little bit more from the other agencies that weren't here that Naomi mentioned. So I think I'm agreeing, but I, I guess I'm just wondering if this will move on into like the subcommittee realm, you think, um, Bill? Yeah, Sherry. So I think at the first uh, commission meeting, we had started to um, map out a data request for the various federal agencies. I think we have a lot better idea now of some of the topics that we might want to have them expand on. And I think your idea of, of highlighting areas like shared decision making and going to each of the agencies and asking them what they're doing in, the, in that arena would, would make a lot of sense as a, a general approach. Terry, this is quite at just in response to your comment about the, the different employees. Um, I held off on sending that forward for agency clearance because my sense was that we would probably have uh, a better idea of what we wanted to ask after this set of presentations. So I will uh, work with Dr. Herman on some initial tweaks on that and then send it around to the commission for their input and reflection given now the information that we've had today. Great. Are there other general comments? Claudette, I guess I'll turn it back over to you then to wrap up. All right. Thank you, Bill. Um, first of all, thank you to everybody who participated on this afternoon. Um, my special thanks to the presenters who um, had um, excellent presentations that we were able to stay on schedule, and we also had some time for some questions and answers following each of those presentations. Uh, secondly, a thanks to the members of the commission who were not presenters who stayed with us and participated. And then very importantly, thanks to our public who registered for this uh, webinar and I'm hoping have been able to participate and list, or to listen um, for the duration. There's been a lot of information for everyone to absorb um, and this information will guide the National Clinical Care Commission and the subcommittees. Uh, the information will ultimately be posted on our health.gov website. So the audio recording, the PowerPoints, uh, minutes from this particular presentation um, will be available to anyone who wants to uh, resource them and reference them. We'll also be posting our operational plan on the health.gov once it has gone through the 508 compliance. 
Um, lastly, uh, an announcement about the next meeting of our National Clinical Care Commission. This will be held uh, in Bethesda, Maryland, as a full day meeting on June the 27th. Um, and that will be open to the public. So for the public who are still on, uh, this is an opportunity for you to make comments as you have done or have wanted to do. And this re requires a submission in advance and registration for it to you know how many people will be providing public comments and we want those also circulated to our commission members. In addition, the June 27th meeting will be preceded by essentially a half-day meeting on June the 26th for just subcommittee work and preparation by committees to present uh, on June 27th, and that will be, of course, available for the public to hear as well. Those are my main comments. Is there anything further, any points of clarification, um, or any final comments from you, Bill, as our chair? No, I just want to thank everyone again, and um, that was all I had. Well, and then lastly, my uh, big thank you to um, our NIH and uh, KA Kaufman and Associates uh, contractor, especially Jennifer Gillison and uh, Jennifer Wilkinson, and also um, Joy Jackson Farrar for all their assistance. Um, they have been silent for this presentation, but have been very much behind the scenes guiding it and making it as smoothly, uh, as smooth a presentation as it ran for us. So I want to make a public thanks to them as well. Otherwise, I think we can close a few minutes early and uh, look forward to our meeting again, June 27th, Bethesda. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for participating in today's conference. Please disconnect at this time.